We got three people waiting in the building. Hallelujah. Shalom, shalom, mishpacha, wachavirim. It's your girl. 916, Sean, Sean, Sister Ashanti, Shanti Doc, all that, right? So I'm on the YouTube as 916, Sean, Sean. I'm also on Debate Talk for You, YouTube, streaming live. And I'm on my Facebook, streaming live as Shanti Doc. So with that being said, let me let me go ahead and get some things out the way real quick. So since I'm on Debate Talk for You, got to give the the disclaimer, right? So we're going to go ahead and get the formal things out the way. So this is a brand disclaimer for Debate Talk for You. The views and opinions expressed by individuals on this platform, the callers, plus the invited guests are their own. The info you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with this brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. So again, shalom, shalom, l'chol mishpacha v'havirim. Hey, shalom, Yehukanah, brother Yehukanah, what's happening? What's happening? Oh, man. Um, I want to say something <laughs> um, to you all, um, but thank you all for, for tuning in, joining in, those who are listening in live, those who are going to listen in later. We appreciate you. I uh, want to say, want to say um, the, the greeting that I learned in, in the Hebrew. So that is, um, um, so that is, I hope y'all are good and blessed today, right? So today we have another Torah titles of the text, another Torah titles of the text. This is Paradosis part two, Shalom, Shalom, Yasi Ben Israel, Shalom, Shalom, Paradosis part two, why communion? Why communion? Why is it that there is communion being taken in the Protestant churches on Sundays, most Sundays, like every first Sunday, or some people do it quarterly, a first Sunday or some sort of Sunday once every three months or once every four months, something like that. And these are things that I had asked questions in the back of my mind since I was a little child. If you have not gone and listened to Paradosis part one, talking about the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper, please go back and do so. Just to recap, before I introduce my guests here, and then we're going to get into a lot of reading today, a lot of information sharing, a lot of source sharing, right? So go back and look at Paradosis part one. Paradosis is the Greek word that means tradition, right? And when you look at Matthew 15, Yeshua, Jesus is talking about tradition of the elders. And we looked at that word tradition, which is paradosis, something that is handed down, something that is not necessarily a commandment, but handed down from generation to generation because people get emotionally attached to something and they just keep continuing things, passing it on and in, in ignorance and people picking it up in innocence, right? Especially from people that we love, right? So we talked about the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper from, what is that, Matthew 26? And then also Luke chapter 22. We talked about how the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper is not necessarily the Passover or Pesach. It's actually a ritual fellowship that the Galileans had. Um, it was their last meal, pretty much, which is called the Seuda Mas Masachet. It was their last meal to commemorate the firstborn of Israel who were spared to stay alive during the 10th plague before their exodus out of Egypt, right? So the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper from Matthew 26 or Luke chapter 22 was called the Seuda Masachet, and it was their last meal before they fasted, before they fasted and commemorated the the firstborn spared of Israelites to be kept alive before the Exodus, right? And so we talked about how they were fellowshipping in the upper room with the with the bread and the wine, right? We talked about how they were fellowshipping with the bread and the wine. And we think every time we see bread and wine, it has to be some formal ritual meal fellowship, right? Not necessarily. Me 
you and others, when we come together to a table with our brethren, when we sitting down, how we say over here in America, especially California, we be chopping it up, building with one another, breaking bread, right? We, we, we just sit around and socialize, right? And that's how you build relationships. That's how you build bonds. That's how you get close. And, and, and that's how you stay tightly knit with one another. So that's pretty much what they were doing. And they turned that into a tradition. So that's the actual tradition that was going on in Matthew 26 and Luke 22 with the Lord's Supper. And we also looked at the word um, ev, 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 evkaristas, right? That is the actual pronunciation in the Greek. However, that word is more known commonly today as Eucharist, Eucharist. And that word evkaristas, or what we know today as Eucharist, means thanksgiving. It means Thanksgiving. So when you talk about when 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 Yeshua sitting down his with his disciples talking about, you know, having took the cup and giving thanks, right? That's the word Eucharist. They took the the, the Roman Catholic Church and what my guest here calls the church baby daddies or what's came to be known as the church fathers, what they did is they took that Greek word Eucharist and they said, okay, well, since we see since we see Yeshua, Jesus, and his disciples breaking bread and having wine and, and giving thanks, we're going to take that word for giving thanks, Eucharist, and we're going to call it communion. We're going to call this thing communion, and we're going to associate that word with communion with commemorating some things. And that's what we're going to talk about today in Potidosis Part 2. Why communion? Why communion on first Sundays? Why communion on Sundays, period? Why do you do this? And we, we talked about how Yeshua and the disciples, when it was talked about in Matthew 26, Yeshua said, do this in remembrance of me, right? Do this in remembrance of me. We have to get some things clarified here. So we're going to talk about how the, we're, ta we're going to talk about how the, especially Sunday Christian church strayed away from its Hebraic roots of following what Yeshua and the disciples were actually doing, which was a, a Seuda Masachet, how it went from that to stripping the culture from from what what you know what what makes its DNA to celebrating the Eucharist or the, the communion, what they call the communion, right? Shalom, shalom, uh brother Marcus. So Paradosis part two, why communion? So with that being said, I'm going to allow my guests here to formally introduce themselves. We're going to start with the elder here. So go ahead, brother, brother, with the avatar up. <laughs> <laughs> shalom, shalom, everyone, and blessings to you all. I'm so glad and um, appreciative of being here on the panel to discuss this topic, this great topic with these brilliant Bible believers here, my sister Shanti, my brother B.A., and all of you that are joining us. And yeah, we're going to talk about the church baby daddies a little bit. <laughs> we got we to gotta do that, you know, and I, I call them that because people like to call them church fathers. But what did they father? Nothing but error for the most part, in my opinion. And part of what we're talking about is a lot of these traditions, which are errant, um, that were fathered by these church baby daddies, I meaning they these these things that have replaced what's actually scriptural are illegitimate. The true fathers of the faith are the are the apostles of Christ. So I'm looking forward to getting into this because as I was doing my research and study, um, some very interesting things came up. And as you were talking about the Eucharist and all these other things, um, I think we talked about this in our in our study before that <laughs> in researching these things, you're going to find out some interesting things. I'm going to save it for when we get into it. Oh, yeah, definitely love to have you here with your commentary, with your, with, with your commentary and comedy, you know, because <laughs> I believe in getting educated and I believe in having, having fun and being entertained a little bit while we're getting educated, right? It makes education more fun and, and palatable and, and um, better to retain, right? And shalom, Brother Jermaine. Yes, peace and blessings. Shalom, Brother Chut. 
Yes, it took us a long time. It took me a long time. <laughs> The right. man cracked me up. He, he's, <laughs> be, he basically tell us, y'all bet not make me wait. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We made it. You wait this long. <laughs> long brother, you made. Good grief. What's wrong with you, Sister Shanti? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I should sing the song from Aaron B. and Rakim. It's been a long time. <laughs> right. <I> left you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Without a part two to step two, right? Okay. <laughs> but we glad you're here, Brother Jermaine. We here now, right? All right. So thank you, Brother Brother Blacktastic, Mr. Blacktastic, Yeshaya. We definitely look forward to what you have to to input and impart um, with your with your wisdom and and for me your expertise uh, in the church baby daddies better than I. I would say. So my next guest, I'm going to let him formally, formally introduce himself. Go ahead, my brother. Yeah, unmute yourself. See, this is what happens with BA. Yeah, we we good now. BA, you gotta get your uh, you gotta get your technical apparatuses up, you know. <laughs> nah, just uh, greetings to all. I'm nobody important. Um, greetings to all human beings under the sun, and we're just glad to be amongst um other human beings. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Let's get into the information. See, BA like to be so cool and humble, and just you lay back. Well, watch, watch when we get into this thing. No, watch. He gonna he gonna be lively. <laughs> he gonna be vibrant. <laughs> he gonna start preaching. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's that's BA's that's BA's tone for right now. You know, but with that being said, thank y'all for coming in. Thank y'all for coming in. So let me say the greeting again. Let me say it a little better, if if I can, if I remember. So. Ani mekave shakulechem osim tov omevarachim hayom. I hope y'all are doing good and blessed today. So, with that being said, let's get into this. So, I'm going to put up source after source after source after source. We're going to read, 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 read <laughs> because this is vital here, right? Most of the sources you could look up yourself. It's just about taking the time to tediously go through it. And it's from Christian Classics Ethereal Library, C-C-E-L, right? C-C-E-L, excuse me. So uh, let me go ahead and screen share here. And just to add, remember, audience, these are Christian sources. So we didn't make this up. We didn't put it off the trash can. These are Christian sources. <laughs> this information here, I would I would just like to add just real quick before sis gets into it. No, no, real quick. Go ahead, BA, do your thing. Is that after you get this information and, and look it up for yourself, and after we share, I mean, if you share this with you, look it up for yourself. When you guys are rambling and arguing with the same people over and over, like you always do. Pull out this stuff and have your Christian buddies answer these questions. And I'm done. Yeah, nothing against them. It's just, hey, people like me, Brother B.A., Mr. Blacktastic, we grew up in the church, Sunday church. We, we had questions. The Most High put it on our heart to get these questions answered. And then after we got the questions answered, we were like, okay, some things need to make an adjustment because we're off track. We got convicted. We got convicted. Whether we liked it or not. Because we had a, a, a sincere, and we do have and still have a sincere love for the Most High Yod, Hey, Wah, Hey, Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. That's why we're doing this. That's why we made the adjustments. That's that's why we 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 made some changes, you know. So during the, what you would call the second and the third century CE, you got what Mr. Blacktastic calls the church baby daddies coming into play. Now these church baby daddies, they claim to be 
third or fourth generation students of the apostles that you see in the in the New Testament or Brit Hakadasha, right? However, Paul says, hey, if anybody teaches, if, if if anybody comes along to you and teaches you something different after what we gave you, let them be accursed. What we see in the second and third century CE is a whole bunch of 180 differences from what the original appointed apostles taught. And that's what we're getting to today. So let's go to it. Let's see here. Let's see. What do we have here? <laughs> right? Let me let me make this just a tad bit bigger. So everyone can see. All right. So what we're going to talk about is, first and foremost, some, some terminology, right? Some terminology, and we're getting to how, we're getting, we're getting to how the, the Sunday church looks so different from its, its Hebraic or Jewish roots, how it, how it looks so far from their brethren. I would say they are the brethren. They just strayed away a little bit. And you've got these church fathers coming in, fleecing the people, and by their own authority, making these changes that were not deemed to them from the original apostles, from, from Yeshua's disciples onto the apostles. Paul, James, Peter, right? So they came up with something called the Lord's Day. S-U-N Day. The Lord's Day. We're going to get into that right now. So uh, let's see here. So this is a uh, history of the Christian church. These links I'll put in the description box after I'm done. I'll put them in the description box in the YouTube. And um, if I need be, I'll put them somewhere in the comment section on the Facebook because I'm going live there as well. Right. All right. So history of the Christian church, the Lord's Day. Watch this. The celebration of the Lord's Day in memory of the resurrection of Christ dates undoubtedly from the apostolic age, apostolic age. I would say what? Second, third century. Right. Nothing short of apostolic precedent can account for the universal religious observance in the churches of the second century. See, when we're talking about New Testament, Shah, the original disciples, we're talking about first century CE. Whatever they laid down is whatever we're supposed to follow. These people who come later, second, third, I don't know, questionable. So let me continue. There is no dissenting voice. This custom is confirmed by the testimonies of the earliest post-apostolic writers as who? Remember these names, Barnabas, Ignatius, and Justin Martyr. Who are these people? They're not the original people. And what I mean by the original people is they're, they're not direct students who are teaching what was directly handed down from James, Peter, and Paul and the like, right? It is also confirmed by the younger Pliny. The Didache calls the first day the Lord's day of the Lord. So the Didache, that's a Greek word meaning the teaching, right? Didache. And they have this document that comes second, third century called the Didache, and these church fathers or church baby daddies, people like Barnabas, Ignatius, Martyr, right? They they start def they start redefining they start redefining what we don't see in the text. Right? So they want to call the first day of the week or S U N day. They want to call Sunday the Lord's Day of the Lord. Continuing, it says, considering that the church was struggling into existence and that a large number of Christians were slaves of heathen masters, we cannot expect an unbroken regularity of worship and a universal cessation of labor on Sunday until the civil government in the time of Constantine came to the help of the church and legalized and in part enforced the observance of the Lord's day. Constantine, Roman Emperor Constantine. Right? Came along in what? The third century CE. See, we're seeing some things here. <laughs> right? 
This may be the reason why the religious observance of it was not expressly enjoined by Christ and the apostles. See, that's that's what they're saying here. Right? They're talking about it may be the reason why the religious observance of it was not expressly enjoined by Christ. Well, we don't see it was enjoined by Christ at all. But as far as excuse me, as for similar reasons, there is no prohibition of polygamy and slavery by the letter of the New Testament, although its spirit condemns these abuses and led to their abolition. They're trying to make a comparison, right? Now, I did a lesson on polygyny, which is one man to many women, and I did look at Leviticus 18, and I saw that it was a prohibition. You can go back and look at that, right? We may go further and say that coercive Sunday laws are against the genius and spirit of the Christian religion, which appeals to the free will of man and uses only moral means for it, its ends. A Christian government may and ought to protect the Christian Sabbath. And we're going to look at this term and, and I'm going to have a, I'm, I'm going to have brother Black Tassie talk about that term Christian Sabbath. Right? So a Christian government may, and ought to protect the Christian Sabbath against oath and desecration, but its positive observance by attending public worship must be left to the con conscientious conviction of individuals. Religion cannot be forced by law. It loses its value when it ceases to be voluntary. All right? Let me continue. The fathers did not regard the Christian Sabbath, excuse me, the fathers did not regard the Christian Sunday as a continuation of, but as a substitute for the Jewish Sabbath and based it not so much on the fourth commandment and the primitive rest of God and creation to which the commandment expressly refers as upon the resurrection of Christ and the apostolic tradition. So it, it's, it's being laid here as a foundation that Sunday you know, like Matthew 28, they say, okay, since it says the first day of the week when the two Marys came and saw that the tomb of Yeshua Jesus was empty, this apostolic church and the church fathers who come second and third century CE, they say, okay, well, Christ must have risen on this Sunday, this SUN day. So we're, we're going to celebrate this resurrection on this Sunday. So they're calling it the apostolic tradition. And they're saying, this Christian Sunday is pretty much a substitute for the Jewish Sabbath. And they didn't base it on the fourth commandment. Right? So this is where we start getting the straying away. This is this is building as to why, you know, people are taking communion on the Sunday. People translate Martin, you know, Matthew 26 is some sort of thing to do Sunday, right? Right. Shalom, shalom, brother Sean. Let me continue. There was a disposition to disparage the Jewish law and the zeal to prove the independent originality of Christian institutions. What that tell y'all? To prove independent originality of Christian institutions? I know Christ came to bring a sword. However, did Christ come to bring this kind of sword? Sounds They're supposed like to huh? Go ahead, BA. No, I was going to say, sounds like somebody's trying to implement something else into something that doesn't fit. There you go. All right, let me continue. The same polemic interest against Judaism ruled in the Paschal controversies, which we're going to talk about, and made Christian Easter a movable feast. <laughs> we're going to talk about that in a minute. Nevertheless, Sunday was always regarded in the ancient church as a divine institution, at least in the secondary sense as distinct from divine ordinances in the primary sense, which were directly and positively commanded by Christ as baptism and the Lord's Supper. See? You, you got to watch the twisting of the words here, but they're talking about this thing was always regarded in the ancient church. What do they mean by ancient church? Do they mean second or third century CE, or do they mean first century CE? Let's continue. Regular public worship absolutely requires a stated day of worship. See, this is that Roman Catholic Church stuff. And most Protestants or people who grew up Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or Apostolic, they all Protestants. They all like Catholics. And you see, sis, we're about to talk about that good old boy Ignatius. 
Oh boy. Oh, boy. Yes. It's gonna, it's gonna get good now. It's about to get good. It's about to go down. It's about to go down. All right. So Ignatius was the first who contrasted Sunday with the Jewish Sabbath as something done away with. So when you get people like, you know, the dollar dollar dude, the dollar dollar dude, that's what I'm gonna call him, right? When you get people talking, when you get people like that talking about, oh, these things are done away with, we don't gotta do these things, you know what I mean? Like, do they know who this stuff originally be coming from? These church baby daddies, CBDs, church fathers, they don't even probably do any research about. Right? So did the author, so did the author of the so-called epistle of Barnabas, right? So Ignatius, Barnabas, martyr, right? Just a martyr in controversy with a Jew, which we're going to read a little bit later, says that the pious before Moses please God without circumcision and the Sabbath, and that Christianity requires not one particular Sabbath, but a perpetual Sabbath. Okay, there is a perpetual Sabbath, yes, but this perpetual Sabbath, we're going to, in the text, we don't see it has anything to do with an SUN day. And we're going to see how SUN day came to be, who instituted it, and all that good stuff. Right? Now, these people here, we're talking about Ignatius, Barnabas, uh, Martyr. They, if they were direct students of the original apostles, they wouldn't be saying half of this stuff. because. I believe Moses definitely followed the Sabbath. All right? All right. Who's, who's Cameron? That's interesting. Let me continue. All right. He assigns as a reason for the selection of the first day for the purposes of Christian worship because on that day, God dispelled the darkness and the chaos, and because Jesus rose from the dead, and appeared to his assembled disciples, but makes no allusion to the fourth commandment. Now, did Jesus say, take communion, bread, and wine in remembrance of me because I'm about to rise from the dead? Or was it a commemoration of the firstborn, as we saw in Shofarim, Tractate 21? Tractate Shofarim 21, we saw that what? The Galilean Jews, they did a ritual meal, the Seudo Mavsechet, right? The day before Passover to commemorate what? The firstborn Israelites being spared from being killed. We don't see Jesus or Yeshua saying, do this in remembrance of me of when I wrote, when I'm going to rise from the dead. We do not see that in the text in Matthew 26 and Luke 22. All right. So continuing with uh, Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr, he uses the term to, sabbat to, to sabbatize, right? Sabbatizing, the, the Greek word, only of the Jews, except in the passage just quoted, where he spiritualizes the Jewish law. That's where you get these people talking about, oh, the law is just spiritual, and we just need to have mental assent that it existed and that was it, it was good. All right? Let me continue. Dionysius of Corinth mentioned Sunday incidentally in a letter to the Church of Rome, A.D. 170. Today we kept the Lord's Day holy, in which we read your letter. Mileto of Sardis wrote a treatise on the Lord's Day, which is lost. Irenaeus of Lyons, about 170, bears testimony to the celebration of the Lord's Day, but likewise regards the Jewish Sabbath merely as a symbolical and typical ordinance and says that Abraham, without circumcision and without observance of Sabbath, believed in God, which proves the symbolic and temporary character of those ordinances and their inability to make perfect. See, the Most High didn't say, I'm giving you this Torah, these instructions, this law to make you perfect. Most High didn't say that. Can I add something real quick, too? Just Absolutely. Real Absolutely. Notice the year is 170. 170 CE. None of the apostles are around anymore. Man. And any of their students after them. So this is all new. 
in a lot of the Jewish sect or the Israelite sects, they were they were like excommunicated. You know what I'm saying? Um, look it up. The Abianites, the Nazarenes, the various uh, very first believers in Christ who were known to keep Torah. These guys are no longer around. I mean, they're around, but they've been excommunicated. They've been distant. Just want to share that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Tertullian. Another another name here that's just popping up, right? Tertullian at the close of the second and beginning of the third century. Remember what I said, second and third century CE, right? He views the Lord's day as figurative of rest, <laughs> just figurative of rest from sin and typical of man's final rest and says, oh, and, and says this, this is, this is wild. We have nothing to do with Sabbaths, new moons, or the Jewish festivals, much less with those of the heathen. See, the thing is, when some folk want to call, when some folk want to call these things Jewish festivals, see, in the text, they are not called Jewish festivals. They're called the Most High Yod Hey Wahes festivals. You know no. why? Because they were given to humanity to begin with in the first place. No, I thought they were Jewish festivals. I thought they were for Israelites only. Keep going. Right? <laughs> Shalom, Pastor Biz. What's happening? What's happening, Pastor Biz? Thank you for coming in. Don't die. Don't die. Yeah. Hey, this is some good stuff, right? We might he, we might be here for a minute. We might be here for a minute. I ain't got nothing to do for a few hours. <laughs> right? So he continues to say, Tertullian, we have our own sol so solemnities, the Lord's Day. <laughs> our own. That's a clue. It, it, you know, it wasn't set forth from, from the, the people who originally got this way of life, right? It says we have our own so solemnities, the Lord's Day, for instance, and Pentecost. Shavuot. You talking about they got their own Pentecost? That's crazy. As the heathen confine themselves to their festivals, they want to call. <laughs> they want to call the pagans, you know, or the heathens, you know, what what they do. But these people that we're talking about right here, the, the just the martyrs, the Ignatiuses, the Barnabases, and the Tertullians. Well, you know, they can be they can be heathen. They can be known as heathen to me. Because they're over here going against doing the total 180 from what the most high set for. Let me say shalom, shalom, Sister Courtney. Shalom, shalom, Sister Courtney. That's you, Africa Hair Loss. Thank you for tuning in. All right, let me continue. So, um, as the heathen confine themselves to their festivals and do not observe ours, let us confine ourselves to ours and not meddle with those belonging to them. He thought it wrong to fast on the Lord's day or to pray kneeling during its continuance. Sunday we give to joy, but he also considered it Christian duty to abstain from secular care and labor, lest we give place to the devil. <laughs> this is wild. This is wild. This is the first express evidence of cessation from labor on Sunday among Christians. The habit of standing in prayer on Sunday, which Tertullian regarded as essential to the festive character of the day, and which was sanctioned by an ecumenical council, was afterwards abandoned by the Western Church. Ecumenical council? See, these councils, like you said, B.A., they involve people who were originally, who, they, they involve people who were excommunicated, who, uh, who, who definitely were were um given the original hebraic way of life right and these councils came in from who rome people of rome who really wanted nothing to do with the way of life of the most high yod hey wahe but they wanted the benefits they wanted the benefits that came from yod hey wahe which was what eternal life so they want the benefits but they don't want to do nothing else. They don't want to have nothing to do with nothing else. 
that 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 has this that has you having to live this way of life. They just want the benefits. What that sound like to y'all? Sound like some entitlement to me. Shalom, brother Ernest Higgs. It just sounds like as we continue to read further, and as we see throughout history, as time progresses and in, in these sources we're going through, mm -hmm. that what the apostles, the the foundation that they laid down, that they taught, that they stood on, has been forgotten. Yep. We have all these forgotten. changes. Yeah, we have all these changes. I mean, this stuff here, you can you can take to your Christian buddies. Have them look at this stuff. I doubt they've read it. I doubt they looked into it or they're in complete denial. Yeah. So my thing is like you 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 just want the benefits. You just want to be saved and go to heaven. You just want you you want to have mental ascent. Like Mr. Black Tastic says so eloquently. They want to have mental ascent. They be like, "Yeah, we believe." And they say that just cuz they want to go to heaven. Right. They want the, they want the benefits. But they, they don't want to do what it takes. They don't want to do what it takes. That's crazy. All right. Let me continue. The Alexandrian fathers have essentially the same view with some fancies of their own concerning the allegorical meaning of the Jewish Sabbath. Now, allegorical. Okay. We see then that the anti-Nicene church clearly distinguished the Christian Sunday from the Jewish Sabbath. And put it on independent Christian ground. Anti-Nicene. Those are those, you know, what they what they call the ecumenical councils. You know, they had several of these councils. Uh, the 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 one famous one, you know, they pretty much came uh, together. These uh, the 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 people of Rome, right, came together to see if Christ was a deity, and to talk about Easter. We're we going to talk about that in a hot second. Right? So anti means before. B.A. got to step back in. I'm going to bring B.A. back in when he come back in. All right. She did not fully appreciate the perpetual obligation of the fourth commandment in its substance as a weekly day of rest rooted in the physical and moral necessities of man. This is independent of those ceremonial enactments which were intended only for the Jews and abolished by the gospel. See, like I say, <laughs> what the most high laid down, the most high gave to humanity from the get-go. The most high gave to humanity from the get-go. The most high made Adam, them. Them is him, male and female, right? The most high said, Abad, Ishamar, work and serve, work and guard, keep, work and guard. Gave that commandment to humanity. All humanity was supposed to be doing these things. Why? Because humanity has one creator. Right? When it's talking about it's only for the Jews, no, it's for humanity. The Most High used Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to spearhead humanity to come back to the Most High. The gospel actually reinforces that. The gospel makes sure that we understand Isaiah 61, Yeshua is that door that has humanity going through it to get it back to paradise or Eden in which humanity first first dwelled. Right? We're supposed to be living Eden. All right. Let me continue. But on the other hand, the church took no secular liberty, liberties with, with the day. On the question of theatrical and other amusements, she was decidedly puritanic and ascetic and denounced them as being inconsistent on any day with the profession of a soldier of the cross. She regarded Sunday as a sacred day, as the day of the Lord, as the weekly commemoration of his resurrection and the Pentecostal effusion of the spirit, and therefore as a day of holy joy and thanksgiving to be celebrated even before the rising sun by prayer, praise, and communion with the risen Lord and Savior. Right? Sunday, as you in, and I keep saying as you in, I keep spelling it out for a reason, as you in. Right? Sunday, le Sunday legislation began with Constantine. So I know in 110 CE, certain um, people of Rome, these church baby daddies, they started saying, hey, we're just going to 
separate ourselves and say we're gonna go ahead and 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 rest and do these commemorations on Sunday, right? One ten, and then that was one ten CE, and then Constantine came in in three twenty one CE and made it official. He was the Roman emperor of this time, right? So that's what it's saying here. Sunday legislation began with Constantine and belongs to the next period. The observance of the Sabbath among the Jewish Christians gradually ceased. Yet the Eastern Church to this day marks the seventh day of the week, accepting only the Easter Sabbath <laughs> by omitting fasting and by standing in prayer, while the Latin Church, in direct opposition to Judaism, made Saturday a fast day. Right? You got all these people coming up with these traditions, coming up with these these things. It's just because they want to hold fast to what what's what's convenient to them. All right. The controversy on this point began as early as the end of the second century. Remember I said second century, third century CE, you got these people coming in who have nothing to do with what the original disciples and apostles taught. We see like, they're actually straying away. Go ahead. No, like you said earlier, <laughs> second to third century is when we start seeing a complete switcheroo, a complete mm -hmm. switcheroo. You know right. what I'm saying? And as we continue to read, through these sources. There's some interesting stuff in here. Um, that for those who are not familiar with this, please write this stuff down. Take the notes. It's going to help you so much. And then you'll get to a point to where you'll find a useless of debate. Seriously, this stuff is this is a wealth of information here. A wealth of it. Right. And yeah. uh, it says Wednesday and especially Friday were devoted to the weekly commemoration of the sufferings and death of the Lord and observed as days of penance or watch days and half fasting, which lasted till three o'clock in the afternoon. Now right. that part, can I come in on that? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Leave the screen right there because here's what's mm -hmm. interesting. They know, I'll say uh, the, the, the church baby daddies knew very well that a Friday to Sunday three days and three nights was impossible. Mm. They also knew, because you can tell from scripture, it can be charted very clearly, if you put the gospels together, that Christ was crucified on a Wednesday. And so the fact that this is even documented here in this last paragraph exposes the fact that they know this. So then the question is, why did they just decide to go away from all of this information and it has a lot to do with what you read earlier because mm -hmm. the purpose was to turn people away from what they call Jewish customs, teachings, the Jewish Sabbath, and you hear the divisive language that's used, such as now instead of the Jewish Sabbath, it's the Christian Sabbath. You'll start hearing different terminology inserted because you're starting to hear the anti-Semitism mm. that is coming out of what has now become a predominantly uh, Gentile dominated ecclesia or church now. And the more Gentile the church or the ecclesia became and the less Hebrew it remained, the more pagan it became. And so all of these things happen. And the, and the interesting thing is for anybody that cares to do the research and can get past their tradition, they mm. documented that they did this. It's not, you know, when people say, well, the information was hidden from us. No, it's not. You got to dig it up. You got to look That's for right. it. It's there. Right. But if you don't know where to look, you won't find it. Mm -hmm. And so they document their own deviation which I think is amazing. And um, even with all of the, the councils, mm. you know, you have these, these ecumenical councils, which basically what you're going to have is a total of six or seven ecumenical councils. So you, you start with the Council of Nicaea in 325, which is the first one. Mm -hmm. And then, then this is where they're discussing the deity of Christ and things of this sort. They didn't invent Jesus Christ at this council. They didn't invent Christianity at this council, as people often erroneously um, suppose or spread. That's, that's not what happened. 
the conversation was completely different. And so at this council is where they really begin to establish the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, think about this. Why did it take them almost 300 years later mm. to establish something that can't be clearly seen in Scripture? Well, because it's not there. And so, again, this is, but see, now what you're getting with the councils is they're codifying their deviation and turning it into doctrine yep. and making, and, and they have the help of an imperial government to back them. And once you, like you said earlier, once you mix government with faith, and it's not a true theocracy, mm. as Israel had before the monarchy, you're always going to have these deviations. You're going to have a perversion of doctrine because the government is only going to allow the ecclesiastical body to legislate what benefits the government and doesn't conflict with the government. So anything you pass in that type of religious system, that's a combination of the feet and clay, as we see in Daniel's vision, mm -hmm. is going to be it's not going to be cohesive. It's not going to stick because it's going to create its own problems because it has the seeds of its own destruction within itself. And so you had the second council, the Council of Constantinople at 381, mm -hmm. and this is where they finally decided what the Holy Spirit was. Now think about it. <laughs> <laughs> they, the apostles didn't need to have councils on what they knew who God was. They knew who Yeshua right. was. They knew what the Ruach Waka did. None of this stuff comes about until the church baby daddies start bringing in paganism and mm. messing up the doctrines that the apostles actually taught. Once John's disciples die off, there's nobody else to mind the fence. Oh. And so you have now a Gentile dominated church. And when I say that, I'm really not trying to give a racial um, division, but what I'm talking about is culture. So you have those that don't come from a Hebraic culture who are now the dominant players or mm. population in the media, mm. and they're looking for accommodations that suit what they already believe. So there's not a complete divorcing of culture. And here's one of the issues. Hebrew culture is divisive for this reason, because it's even divisive for Hebrews. And let me say why. The reason is because the standard that we call Hebrew culture is a heavenly standard. It's the only culture given by the Most High. So in essence, it's not even really Hebrew culture. It's right. heavenly culture. Right. So we have the king. I mean, what did Christ say? He preached the gospel of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So we have a standard that we're commanded to live by, and that standard goes against every system in the world. Yeshua said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword because he knew if you walk by these standards, if you live out the Torah, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be separated from everyone else. And right. that's why Israel was called a peculiar people. And so I'm trying not to talk too long. I was trying to listen. Okay. And then the, the third council, you had the Council of Ephesus, and then you had the fifth council, the Council of Chalcedon. You had the then you had a second Council of Constantinople in about 553 um, AD. And around this time, also during this particular council, I believe, and I would have to, I have to check myself on this, but I know that it was during this century at least, is when they reintroduced tithing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, there, is, there is no tithing in, in, in the first century Ecclesia, but when you get here, they reintroduce tithing, and what's now you have a really a firm developing Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And let me say this without trying to offend people, but I got to tell you the truth. Tell it. <laughs> you know, Catholicism and Christianity are synonymous terms. They are mm. the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> they are the same thing. So 
at this point, you know, just the Catholicism means, you know, Catholic means universal, but Christianity is, is the system. They, you know, they try to bring a universal system of belief along the lines of what they call Christianity. But I've said this from a personal perspective, and people say I'm playing semantics, but I've always maintained that it, since I've come into this information, the Christianity and the Christian faith are mm -hmm. not the same thing. Right. The Christian faith of the Bible is not the Christianity that came out of these church baby daddies, which most of the world follows. Mm -hmm. So you can be a Christian without being in Christianity, because if you're a follower and disciple of Christ, you're a Christian, but you don't yep. have to be in Christianity. Right. But here with this council, you're going to start to have a lot of your current structure being set up that yep. people still mirror today. And you see it with all of the clerical types of aspects that people govern churches by. And mm -hmm. if you just go to any church, go to the Baptist church, the church God in Christ, the apostolic church, the, the, the Presbyterian church, and ask them why they're wearing those robes. Yeah. Ask them why they're wearing those vestments. None of that's biblical. That's all pagan. Even a lot of the things that they do that go along with that, all these, you know, everybody, I remember when I was coming up in the ministry, everybody want to get a bad preaching role. Ooh, man, I'm getting a role. You know, and however <laughs> the role was, they said, man, you, you better be able to preach when you got a robe like that. But that is an adoption from paganism. <laughs> and the whole invention of clergy and laity is also another invention of Catholicism, which comes from paganism. Because the clergy determined clerics, the Druidic priests, the pagan priests were the clergy. They were the clerics. And the people who they subjugated became their laity. All right. You know, and so all of these things start to come out as you see these councils progress and as you see more and more and more of these types of doctrines and things. And so somebody said, what were the original apostles calling themselves? What well, had a variety of things they called themselves? They weren't as stuck on what their title was. They called themselves followers of the way. They just called themselves believers. Right. They, they did not have an aversion to the term Christian. They had no problem with that. It was not. There's another false conception that Christian was created as an insult. There's absolutely no historical documentation whatsoever to support that. That is a false notion and supposition that's been presented and circulated for a long time now, and it can't be substantiated by facts. So people need to stop saying that. You can't prove it, you gotta lose it. And so furthermore, because again, we have scripture evidence that speaks to the contrary, all right? That they, they didn't have a problem with that term. <laughs> This didn't become popular until after they died. All right. And so we have to remember that there's a lot of history that takes place. And so we we too can't embellish history in telling the true story. And uh, then you had the uh you had the, the you had a third council of Constantinople in 680. And at your final council, which was the second council of Nicaea. At the conclusion, I believe it was this particular council that they made a decision that all Jewish or Nazarene Christians had to be excommunicated for continuing to worship on the Sabbath and practice the same customs, ironically, which the apostles taught. So they weren't upholding the teachings of the apostles or the apostles' doctrine that's given to them from Christ, and, and that were based on what had already been delivered through the prophets and Moses, they were completely departing from it. And this is why you start to get all these divisive terms like the Christian Sabbath versus the Jewish Sabbath. Sunday, they put, they pit Sunday mm -hmm. against, you know, Saturday or so to speak, the Sabbath. And or the seventh day, right. Right, the seventh day, right. So they're creating in an entirely new culture by creating a new doctrine to yep. try to separate themselves. And the anti-Semitism at this point, at this final council, all of those who still worship like the apostles did, who still practice water baptism in the name of Yeshua like the apostles, who still believed in the gifts of the spirit, 
like the apostles and all of these other things, they basically had to go further east because, yeah. you know, and so they end up scattering to different parts, you know, of the known world. And they'll also be part of several inquisitions or religious persecutions. They'll also be murdered during the Crusades and other things of this sort. So Catholicism actually tried to, and still to this day, but in particular during these times and all through the medieval periods of Europe and the Crusades, even through the Spanish Inquisition where they persecuted Jews and other people, Catholicism has had a singular goal that they've never deviated from. And that is to destroy the true Christians or the true faith of the scriptures. Yeah. So that, that's my little spiel. I, I'll say more later. Hey, Elder, oh, you know, you, you just, got a lot more to say. Go ahead. <laughs> I just want to say, Elder, you just uh you just took away Sunday service. I mean, I mean Sun, I mean sunrise service. You just took that away. Man. What, what, oh man, don't get me started. Okay, Saul and Victus. Let's talk about that real quick. <laughs> The other, the other problem with with son. Now listen, let me say this. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. We we get to that. We get to that when we when we talk about this right here. Okay, cool, Is that cool. cool? I'll, I'll, I'll hold on. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no okay. problem. Yeah, yeah, because we I, I got you. I got you. <laughs> but Isaiah, you know what I mean? I'm a, I'm gonna get this, and then I'm gonna give you an E flat, right? And then I'm gonna let you go <laughs> in. Dun, 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 you know what I'm saying? I'm I'm gonna give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. All right. Hey, one more thing I wanted to say uh before we continue, because I, I do got a lot to read. You see, I got I got one more link. One, two, three, four. I got four more links to read. Now I know I say I ain't got nothing to do in a few hours, but yeah, we're gonna try to hold y'all attention. This might be three hours. <laughs> Now, we ain't going to do no marathon here, okay? We ain't going to do no marathon. We ain't going to be on here for 10 hours, though. I'll tell y'all that right now. <laughs> we ain't going to be on here for 10 hours. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but um, the Lord's Day, these are the passages that, these are some of the passages that these, these church fathers who come later down the line, This is these, these are some of the passages that they, try to use to signify that their Christian Sabbath is is legit to be um, followed, right? So you see Matthew 28 and 1, Mark 16 and 2, Luke 24 and 1, John 21 and 1, uh, Acts 20 and 7, and 1 Corinthians 16 and 2, right? All right. So again, all of these are from ccel.org. Right, and I'll put the links in the description box after I get here. So Eucharist, why communion? We're getting there, all right. But we had to establish the vernacular about this Lord's Day and what it was, right? So we saw the Lord's Day. They're saying, oh, okay, since the Lord Yeshua rose on a Sunday, which they can't prove that He rose on a Sunday, they're going to say, okay, well, this breaking of the the bread and the drinking of the wine we're going to call it the eucharist communion and we're going to celebrate the resurrection on sunday right yeah yeah if you're going to say it you got to say it right you you got to you got to put some gruff and some huff in your voice i got to put the gruff and you got to say okay. and he got up he got up early one sunday morning <laughs> <laughs> you know how they get. <laughs> hey, go James Brown. Get on up. Get into it. Get involved. Right. Yeah. I don't oh, know what you're going to do. You know what I mean? He told yeah. me he's the bunny. He's going to take these eggs and chocolate and tell my son. <laughs> <laughs> I should have got an organ player for this for this lesson right here. I should have. I should have. Dang it. Who y'all know out there play the organ right now? Who ain't at Sunday service right now? Who ain't at afternoon service right now? Who played them keys? Go ahead. Let them know about Sean Sean right here. And I'm going to say Sean Sean, Shanti Doc. Let them know. 
I'm gonna get them on up in here. I'm gonna give them the link. <laughs> Cause we need some chords to this, right? <laughs> Shalom, brother Scott Harris. Excuse me, not Scott Harris. Scott Garrett. Shalom, brother Scott Garrett Headley. And Shalom, Elcom Barlow. <laughs> Shalom. Thank y'all for coming in. Thank y'all for coming in. All right. So Eucharist, right? This is the Apostolic Fathers with Justin Martyr and Irenaeus. Again, ccel.org. This is chapter two of this conversation here. It is, when Christ visited us in his grace, he did not come to what did not belong to him. Also, by shedding his true blood for us and exhibiting to us his true flesh in the Eucharist, he conferred upon our flesh the capacity of salvation. So let me read. In vain, likewise, are those who say that God came to those things which did not belong to him, as if covetous of another's property, in order that he might deliver up that man who had been created by another to that God who had neither made nor formed anything, but who also was deprived from the beginning of his own proper formation of men. The advent, therefore, of him whom these men represent as coming to the things of others was not righteous, nor did he truly redeem us by his own blood if he did not really become man, restoring to his own handiwork what was said of it in the beginning, that man was made after the image and likeness of God, not snatching away by stratagem the property of another, but taking possession of his own in a righteous and gracious manner. As far as concerned the apostasy, indeed, he redeems us righteously from it by his own blood, but as regards us who have been redeemed, he does this graciously, for we have given nothing to him previously, nor does he desire anything from us as if he stood in need of it, but we do stand in need of fellowship with him. And for this reason, it was that he graciously poured himself out that he might gather us into the bosom of the Father. But vain in every respect are they who despise the entire dispensation of God and disallow the salvation of the flesh and treat with contempt its regeneration maintaining that it is not capable of incorruption. But if this indeed do not attain salvation, then neither did the Lord redeem us with his blood, nor is the cup of the Eucharist the communion of his blood, nor the bread which we break the communion of his body. Right? So what are they calling here? The cup and the bread. They're calling it the Eucharist, the communion. Right? We continue. They say, for blood can only come from veins and flesh, and whatsoever else makes up the substance of man, such as the word of God, was actually made. By his own blood he redeemed us, as also his apostles declares, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the remission of sins. And as we are his members of the body, right, we are also nourished by means of the creation, and he himself grants the creation to us. For he causes his son to rise and sends rain when he wills. He has acknowledged the cup, which is a part of the creation, as his own blood, from which he bedews our blood, like sprinkles our blood, right? Or sprinkles it, nourishes it, right? And the bread, also a part of the creation, he has established as his own body, from which he gives increase to our bodies. Now, yes, this is mostly symbolic, not literal. And I'll have Brother Isaiah talk about that in a little bit of how the, the, the Church of Rome here is, is taking metaphor or symbolicness away um, from, from what happened in Matthew 26 with, with the Last Supper, which was the Seud the the ritual meal before their fasting, commemorating the sparing of the firstborn Israelites from being killed in the 10th plague before they exited Egypt, right? We're going to have Brother Isaiah talk about that in a minute. So when, therefore, the mingled cup and the manufactured bread receives the word of God and the Eucharist of the blood and the body of Christ is made, from which things the substance of our flesh is increased and supported, how can they affirm that the flesh is incapable of receiving the gift of God, which is life eternal, which flesh is nourished from the body and blood of the Lord and is a member of him? Even as the blessed Paul declares in his epistle to the Ephesians that we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, right? So pretty much the, the, the Eucharist, the, 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 the Ephkaristas, 
right? That word actually means Thanksgiving. That word got transferred to what is called communion, taking the, the wine and taking the bread, right? That's what these church fathers have done with communion. That's what communion is, the Eucharist, right? They're taking the, the, the symbolism of the, the bread and the wine, and they're saying pretty much that literally <laughs> they're taking on um, the body of Christ since they make up members of the entire body of, of Christ, right? All right, so let me continue. <coughs> Woo. He does not speak these words of some spiritual and invisible man, for a spirit has not bones nor flesh, but he refers to that dispensation by which the Lord became an actual man, consisting of flesh and nerves and bones, that flesh which is nourished by the cup, which is his blood, and receives increase from the bread, which is his body. And just as a cutting from the vine planted in the ground fructifies in a season, or as a corn of wheat falling into the earth and becoming decomposed, rises with manifold increase by the Spirit of God, who contains all things, and then, through the wisdom of God, serves for the use of men, and having received the word of God, becomes the Eucharist. So they're saying, okay, <laughs> when, when, you, when you take on the, the, the drinking of the wine and eating of the, the bread, they're saying you become the Eucharist. Right? What just happened? They say you become the Eucharist. Right? We'll continue. They say you become the Eucharist, which is the body and blood of Christ, so also as our bodies being nourished by it and deposited in the earth and suffering deep composition there shall rise at their appointed time, the word of God granting them resurrection to the glory of God, even the Father, who freely gives to this mortal immortality and to this corruptible and corruption, because the strength of God is made perfect in weakness, in order that we may never become puffed up as if we had life from ourselves and exalted against God, our minds becoming ungrateful. But learning by experience that we possess eternal duration from the excelling power of this being, not from our own nature, we may neither undervalue that glory which surrounds God as he is, nor be ignorant of our own nature, but that we may know what God can affect and what benefits man receives, and thus never wander from the true comprehension of things as they are, that is, both with regard to God and with regard to man. Right? So they're saying, okay, you take on, when you drink and you eat, you take on you become just like Yeshua in that you're 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 dying and and you're resurrected. Now we believe in resurrection, but not this way. We believe in dying, but not this way. These people have made up a totally whole different thing. This sounds like some this sounds like some Greek philosophy to me. <laughs> All right, let me continue. And it might not be the case, perhaps, as I have already observed. That for this purpose, God permitted our resolution into the common dust of mortality, that we, being instructed by every mode, may be accurate in all things for the future, being ignorant neither of God nor of ourselves. Right? So that's the question. So with that being said, uh, B.A. or Mr. Blacktastic, you have anything to add for this right here as we're seeing this Eucharist, how it's becoming the communion and what these church baby daddies is, 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 is saying. Is B.A. still there? I'll, yeah, I'll, he's still I'll, here. You know, B.A. with the technical apparatuses. You know, we got to pray for Brother B.A. and his I'll, technical apparatus. I'll, you know let, I mean? <laughs> I'll let B.A. go first because I might, I might have a little bit more to say. So I'm just going to go ahead and comment if you want. No, go ahead, Elder. I mean, let your Elder speak. So you go right ahead and I'll just... Uh, Go off you. It's all good. Thank you, all right. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. So in this, this part right here is also another thing. It's very interesting. And like I said, it's, it's interesting. It's even more interesting to me that they document their deviations as if they're right. You know, <laughs> that's what's funny. <laughs> you know, but if this is just an attempt to tell history straight, 
then I, I respect it because it doesn't leave anything out. But in examining the, the very history that you just went through, you go up to uh, that part number three. Go up to back up to part number three for me. And, and this, this is very interesting because here what they're actually documenting is the infusion of a pagan practice into the faith. And this is not uh, Jewish or Hebrew at all. But they, they say it <laughs> with such conviction, or at least it's recorded that way. When therefore the mingled cup and manufactured bread receives the word of God. Now, that's a problem right there. <laughs> okay. Right. That statement in and of itself is a problem right there. Because when we look at um, the scriptures from the perspective in which they're written, well, Yeshua is called the word of God. All right. And like you said earlier, the term for Eucharist, you know, for Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. when we look at those scriptures, it all it, it highlights the fact that, you know, he gave thanks. He gave thanks. He gave thanks. And that part here, what you see is a almost like an alchemical druidic type service or ritual being established where the literal bread and the wine are transmutated into the actual body and blood of Christ. This is no longer symbolism that we're seeing them talk about here. Mm -hmm. And as we read, it says, the Eucharist of the blood and the body of Christ is made from which days the substance of our flesh is increased and supported. So this is why early on in church history, even before we get to this part, others other pagans thought that followers of the way were literally eat, uh, doing rituals of cannibalism mm. because of this, this type of misunderstanding. But they take the misunderstanding and they actually codify it <laughs> and make it right. doctrine, you know, right. but they wait until they're on top to do this. Yep. And so when it goes on further, it says, how can they affirm that the flesh is incapable of receiving the gift of God, which is which is life eternal, which flesh is nourished from the body and blood of the Lord? Now they're making the carnal physical body uh, the object, really, of the of the benefits of the communion. Your flesh is sinful. It's from the dust it came, and from the dust it's going to return. The Most High already declared that in Genesis chapter three. It's your spirit and your soul that's being saved, not your physical body. Right. You want to get a new body that's right. sinless, not one that needs to eat some type of super duper bread <laughs> and, 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 you know, drink some, you know, vitamin blood to transform it. That's this is completely paganism. And so and this is goes back to a lot of the ideas and thoughts um, that were around in that time that, for instance, if you ate the heart of an enemy, you gained their strength. Um, if you ate certain parts of an animal, you gained its ability. And so this exists at that time. And what people are forgetting also is during the time of Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and all of these, because Justin Martyr, these guys are before the Council of Nicaea. And so you still have a lot of paganism running right and being incorporated with a lot of the worship of Yeshua or worship of Yah. And, and so you have this going on. And so there's there's not a clear distinction, but they're setting the foundation um, for what's going to come. So the Eucharist, as established through Catholicism for the world of Christianity, is not the Lord's Supper. In fact, the word communion is, as it's used in reference to the Lord's Supper, is actually only in scripture in the KJV translation, mm -hmm. you know, and so it does, it's not really there. The, the right. word, you know, and so, you know, you have even other English translations that use um, different terms instead of communion because they know that that word is not accurate in more or at least the most accurate word in terms of the translation right. you know of what this actually was 
but we've taken that now and we've turned that into, you know, the very thing that we're talking about here, you know, a paradosis, a tradition. Right. And so if you say anything against that word, people almost think make the word as holy as what the, the actual um, event is supposed to be. But all of this stuff, again, this is an influx of paganism. And even look at how he goes on to try to be really detailed in explaining the actual man consisting of flesh and nerves and bones, which is nourished by the cup, which is his blood. Th this is not supposed to be the case. The, the, the Lord's Supper is a spiritual thing. It, the, the bread and the body and the blood right. do represent the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, but not in a cannibalistic way. Right, right. Because the transfer is from flesh to spirit. That's right. So it's connecting you to the spirit, right. to the ruach. It's not connecting you to the physical body of Christ. What right. it's saying is you can't come. It's saying the same thing Yeshua said when he said, no man come to the Father except by me. In other words, you can't enter into the spiritual reality until you acknowledge the physical sacrifice of Christ that was made for you. Right. That's why we take the bread and the blood. And in the scriptures, I wanted to show something on my screen. About the bread and the wine? Yeah, it's like, yeah. Um, in, in, just, in just to add to what you were saying, it's flesh, flesh and blood profits nothing, correct? Right, right. And in the scriptures, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 26, um, the Apostle Paul says, yep. you do show the Lord's oh, death until go. he comes, which means that you proclaim, we preach, we witness, we promulgate. We speak of his death. When we do this, we use this to show our, our unity. If, any, if anything, if there's communion, it's the building of binding of the community together behind this message. Right. right. You know, behind this message that the Mashiach has come and that he has sacrificed himself for the sins of lost humanity that we might all again be a re you know established as the people of the most high through him this is not to come and <laughs> <laughs> and do a cannibalistic ritual right right <laughs> right, right 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 this because... is in, in essence what you kind of see in here go ahead i'm sorry no go ahead go ahead because <laughs> you know in the same in the same chapter in first corinthians chapter 11 Mm -hmm. It's interesting that Paul is at when he starts to address this, he's correcting something that they're doing wrong all the time. And you and know why? Says, because this, this, this is this is the absolute original culture he grew up in that he's teaching them that they're coming into. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> that, he the, that the, the Gentile nations are coming into. Yes, exactly. And where is he writing to the church? In Corinth. Corinth, and yeah. the Corinthians are historically known as the out of order church. They had the most mm. problems, right? You know, they were the right. most rebellious. You know, they were gifted, but they were out of order. So both times he has to write two long epistles to them to set them straight mm. because they the problem children. <laughs> you know, and so and so he tells them when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. He's telling them. Y'all are playing you're games. doing it wrong, right? right you're doing you it commemorate wrong. because why Yeshua is the firstborn of creation and firstborn of the dead, exactly, and so, <laughs> right? Exactly, and so, <laughs> exactly. And so <laughs> these folks, <laughs> you know, and in the beginning in the scriptures, these folks are coming together basically feasting and turning it into a, a act of division, right? They, 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 you know, they each got their own. Right, right. They, but then when you know, get, individualism, right? Right, right. But when you get to these church baby daddies, and you know what's funny? Justin Martyr's name is there. Justin Martyr is a church baby daddy who, who snuck in the window. Because even the other church baby daddies who lived at that time didn't regard him as someone of authority with um, who was recognized as a minister or leader. He was a philosopher who got converted, and then he took his philosophy and mixed it with his newfound belief and kind of really ruined a lot of things because yep. other folks 
who would have told you don't listen to Justin at the time he lived, once they died off, other people picked up his crap and end up infusing it into a lot of stuff that we see today. But Justin Martyr wasn't really somebody who people should have been listening to. You know, he basically was that dude in the pews that thought he knew everything. <laughs> and so that's what you have. And so all of this stuff, you know, again, I, I think there's a good book called Our Father Abraham. It's an old book. It may, it may still be available. But um, it talks about the mistake of the, the modern day church goes all the way back to the early, the so-called church fathers, who I call the baby CBDs, you know, church baby daddy. <laughs> CBDs, they got their own gang and stuff, of course. Right, 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 right. With what they put out here, Lord have mercy. Go ahead, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it says that the mistake that the church made was cutting off its Jewish roots. Yeah. Once you cut you off the away, root, where are you going to get your nourishment from? Exactly. Once you go away from the culture that established the faith, you actually go away from a culture of faith. Yeah. Because that's what the culture was. And so that's one, one of the reasons why we have so much of the problems that we have now. And only, <laughs> you know, Yeshua talked about this in the wheat and the tear. And sometimes you try to tell people certain things and they're so resistant and, and only he can can give people light, you know, to walk out of, uh, you know, the darkness that they found themselves in or in the bad traditions that they've been led by. And we have to be patient enough and prayerful enough to sometimes stand back and let that happen. You know, but you've seen the wheat and the tear come up together. And we see that in our day, all the fulfillment of those parables that would speak to what be what would be happening in this time. We're seeing it, but we see the genesis of it with this history right here that you're putting on the screen. Ain't that crazy? Now, all traditions are not bad. Traditions right. are not have tos, right? They're just traditions are things we develop in in life over time. We grow accustomed to these things. They're comfortable. They're cool. They're they, they give us a sense of connection to who, whomever gave it to us, right? right? So we have to look at tradition as when we're talking about coming up with certain traditions, like we have to see if these traditions right here, if they line up with what the Most High gave us through Moses, right? Right. And and if if it's not lining up with what the Most High yod heh wah the Lord God of Israel, gave to Moses, then we have to question it. Exactly. Because one thing I do know is the Most High don't send messengers with the wrong message. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and so if the, the message is wrong, it's because we are wrong, and we need to go back and check the message. You know, again, I saw this question I wanted to just touch on real uh, quick. Um, Brother Scott Garrett Headley said, I was reading in the Midrash of Ruth, Rabbi, seeing them, seeing them calling Rome Esau. That's really not what we're talking about, but I got a quick answer because some people may think it is because they may think, you know, how people tend to think Esau then took over stuff and messed stuff up. The only, the, the, Edom, the only reason they, there's a Rome Esau connection is not because the Romans are Edomites. It's because the, <laughs> yeah, the Idumeans, who are the descendants of Esau that became the kings, such as Herod and different ones, were sellouts who basically had their hand in Rome's pocket, just like the Sadducees amongst the Hebrews. Well, they and converted, so, right? They, they, they converted. Uh, a lot of them converted over. Right. A lot of Judaism Israelites were her, righteous. Her upright, canis, right? right. They were upright, righteous, basically considered Israelites by conversion. You know, because they already spoke Hebrew and they came into the faith. But the Idumeans, you know, were like the aristocrats or elitists. And just like the Sadducees, like Caiaphas, who was the high priest and different ones, their ambitions were more political. And so that tied them into the Roman system. And that's how they ended up getting set up to become rulers, because they basically sold out for them good government jobs. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> right? So, and it fulfills Jacob's prophecy that when Esau got to a certain point, he would break off, you know, basically the, the yoke or whatever of Jacob upon him. So that's really what you're seeing with there. So that's the connection. The Romans aren't Edomites. They just, the Edomites are connected to the Romans as part of the political system because they sold out, just like the Sadducees right. <laughs> primarily did, right? Right. Yeah. For, they want a political position. But yeah, go ahead, B.A. No, I was just saying the Sadducees are more so about political power, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And you have Herod, you know what I'm saying? He was an Edomite or Idumanian, as that some would say. I do I do mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do man. So it's it's common and then like like the elder was saying, um a lot of Edomites at that time, they were Jewish converts. They did convert to the ways of Israel. So um and these are historical facts. I mean, I know that's not the topic, but I was just adding that. You know what I'm saying? Right. For those where, but uh, that's it. I just want to add that. Real quick. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. All right. So we're gonna go to the we're gonna go to the third reading. We have way. I know it's like Shanti, man. This is a lot to read. Yes. You know these things take time. Hey, we need to read some time. You know because we need to understand that true Eucharist, right, is Thanksgiving. But what we've been told Eucharist from the it, it the the form of Eucharist that we're hearing about now is 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 a bastardized version. It's paganized, yep. you know, and it's been diluted and polluted over over time. But you know, in true um, Eucharist, as far as the celebration of the Thanksgiving of things, it's part of our faith. We just got to reclaim it, right? You know, and and teach it the right way, right? Because I'm tired. I was tired of. In church, on my own. If you ain't been baptized, huh? You can't have this cracker. You know that's pretty much this deep. You can't have the cracker. You can't have no juice after you've been starving all service long. How much you ain't been baptized? Well, you know, fine. Come to find out, okay. Y'all telling us we can't have some we wasn't supposed to have in the first place. Start bringing my own snacks to church. That's what I started doing. Okay. You, didn't get, you didn't get one of them old school church pinches. Oh, you're talking about with 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 uh, Jesus in the middle, and 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 and, and the, the disciples six on each side or whatever. No, no, no. you know the, the, the old mothers give you one of them pinches to make you shut up. <laughs> oh yeah, huh? Yeah. Hey, you know I'm gonna tell you this. <laughs> one Sunday, I don't know what my little brother was doing. He was talking or something in church during the time he was supposed to. Yeah. He really literally got hit with the word. You know, <laughs> my mommy picked up the Bible, threw it at him, hit him in the head with it. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> <laughs> See? Hey, they did yeah. some of the wildest things to get us in shape <laughs> in, in church, right? Get us right, huh? Yeah, especially with Pastor talking. You know, when Pastor get to talking, man, you better be quiet. Yeah. You better, you better be not quiet. say nothing. Lord have mercy. Yeah. I know, right, I know, so I know it's a bunch of folks. It's a bunch of folks that we just in the chat that just had flashbacks because we right. all <laughs> <laughs> we all either got one of them pinches or one yep. of them snacks. <laughs> yep. You better not drink it. You better not get one of them crackers. All right. <laughs> Continuing with the Apostolic Fathers with Justin Martyr and Arrhenius. Here, this is chapter nine. And let us live with Christ. Right. So they're making a declaration of the Lord's day and the Eucharist and the communion and all that stuff, right? So let me read this. If, therefore, those who were brought up in the ancient order of things have come to the possession of a new hope, no longer observing the Sabbath, they're talking about the seventh day, right? But living in the observance of the Lord's day, and what did we say the Lord's day was for them? Sunday, as you win. We'll talk about that a little later, right? So, but living in the observances of the Lord's day, on which also our life has sprung up again by him and by his death, whom some deny by which mystery we have obtained faith and therefore endure that we may be found the disciples of Christ, our only master. How shall we abide, excuse me, how shall we be able to live apart from him whose disciples, the prophets themselves in the spirit did wait for him as their teacher. And therefore he whom they rightly waited for being come raised them from the dead. Why is it? If then those who were 
conversant with the ancient scriptures, came to newness of hope, expecting the coming of Christ, as the Lord teaches us when he says, if ye had believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. And again, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad, for before Abraham was, I am. How shall we, how shall we be able to live without him? The prophets were his servants and foresaw him by the Spirit and waited for him as their teacher and expected him as their Lord and Savior, saying, he will come and save us. Let us therefore, no, let me, let me, let me, let me highlight this. Let us therefore no longer keep the Sabbath, the seventh day after the Jewish manner, and rejoice in days of idleness. For he that does not work, let him not eat. What? Yo, we ain't heard that right. Now, this time, let's, let's, let's no longer keep the Sabbath after the Jewish manner. Okay, so the Sabbath was given in creation to humanity. So it's not a Jewish manner. Now, I understand if they're talking about, hey, if you have some issues with the oral laws, how the Pharisees gave burdensome things that were added in uh, in in their, in their oral laws, yeah, that made keeping the Sabbath the burden, right? I can understand that, but somebody says, well, not to keep the Sabbath at all. I'm like, no, that's part of the Ten Commandments then, right? They're saying, okay, we're, 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 we're no longer going to keep the Sabbath and rejoice in days of idleness because they're saying, okay, if you don't work, you don't eat. So they're saying, hey, you got to work on the Sabbath so you can eat. That's what they're saying here, B.A. <laughs> right? Okay, let me continue. Or say the holy oracles in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. <laughs> right? But let every one of you keep the Sabbath, the seventh day, after a spiritual manner, rejoicing in meditation on the law, not a relaxation of the body, admiring the workmanship of God, and not eating things prepared the day before, nor using lukewarm drinks and walking within a prescribed space, nor finding delight in dancing and plaudits, which have no sense in them. Oh, oh, yeah, say so. Go ahead. <laughs> you know what I think is funny is that they <laughs> they quote by saying he that does not work, let him not eat. They're quoting somebody who observed the Sabbath, right? <laughs> but who didn't work on the Sabbath? Are they? Do right. they realize? Is this, is this what I said? It's funny to me that right. they. Document. <laughs> they they documented this stuff. You don't come from this culture, and you trying to speak on a culture you don't come from. <laughs> but but but, you know? but what's so what's so crazy here is that all these things that are being described, these are this is halakha. Right, halakha in um talking about not eating things prepared the day before, nor lo using lukewarm drinks, walking within a prescribed right. space, nor yeah, the, mm -hmm. yep. the, this is this is the oral these are the oral traditions oh, right that were added that made keeping the Torah a burden. <laughs> I repeat the oral traditions th this is what and, and I'll try to be too long. I've said this plenty of times but these traditions, these oral laws were added to Moses. So by the time the first century came in, when Christ was on earth, this was predominantly the, the things that the Israelites or the Jews were keeping at that time. They were keeping what the Pharisees had influenced them to keep because the Pharisees had a major, major effect on the people. So what the Pharisees taught, predominantly the people kept. And these were the oral traditions that were added to the Torah. This is the issue, and you can tell. I can see why Christ can be a stumbling block for most Israelite or Jews. Look how the Christians are, look what they're doing. Yeah. They're just confirming prophecy to be correct. The prophets don't lie. Yeah. Just wanted to say that. And let me add to what you were saying, B.A. Yeshua, Jesus said to the Pharisees, hey, you guys are nullifying you're nullifying the instructions of the Torah that were given to Moses by some of your traditions here. That's what you do. You're making the word of the Most High Yod, Hey, Wah, Hey, Yahweh void when you put some of these traditions on the people that have nothing to do with the Most High Yahweh. 
I'll highlight it. B'nai Yeshurun's comment. <laughs> I love this comment. Let me say this real quick. Brother B.A. and Mr. Black Tax. Man. That, shalom, that, that, shalom. B'nai Yeshurun. That's a slam dunk right there. He took it down the middle and put it in their face. Boom. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's a dagger. That's a dagger. It, it, mm. They just want to skip a whole. <laughs> you just can't. You can't. Do it. I don't know why people fight against this so hard. Like I said, it, it's funny to me. Here they quote a man who literally <laughs> observes the Sabbath. And use his own words to tell other people you gotta work. You know, I, I did a lesson with Brother BA. It's on Debate Talk for You's channel. I did a lesson called the Sabbath Kingdom. See, we're practicing the seventh day Sabbath right now because it's the perpetual day. Right. And what B'nai Yeshurun has highlighted is that. These people talking about the eighth day and a new beginning. You gonna miss the eighth day and a new beginning if you don't enter into the rest or enter into the Sabbath. Exactly. Yeah, you got you got to yeah. you got to exactly. have the Sabbath before you get to the eighth day. Man, that makes so much sense. If you don't come into that rest or that perpetual rest or that Sabbath, you won't make it to the eighth day or the new beginning. Exactly. Because the eighth day <laughs> represents the brand new, the new individual, the, the human being, the right. human being that goes back to, to the garden. Right. When the human being, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, wait, 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 wait. You, you was getting into it, man. Get it. Get it. When, 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 the, when the Most High said, let us create man in our image, that means mankind, the human being. The human being was not created to die. They were eternal beings before they fell. Right. So the human being, so a human, the human being is a spiritual being. So the eighth day, you're just going back to what you originally were in the beginning. Hallelujah. This yeah. stuff is not rocket science. It's not hard. That's right. He did not tell y'all that fire was gonna come out and be in a minute. God. His hat turned to the left. Right, you know. Beard started getting all fluttery. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fire came out. <laughs> the brother looked like goodness gracious. Great balls of fire. Look at him. He gave, he brought it. <laughs> this is my yeah, man. That, 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 boy. But okay, yeah. Let me continue. Let me continue this if I could. What? What? what I'm sorry, brother. Because yeah, the, the seventh day represents completion, perfection. You you can't once you complete things. The eighth day is the jubilee of jubilees. That way, it's eternity for all time. You know, the, and so, like you said, you 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 can't skip steps when it comes to the kingdom. Right. I don't care what tradition you establishes. You know, man's right. tradition never overrides the Most High's truth. It just won't happen. All right, let me continue. And after the observance of the Sabbath, let every friend of Christ keep the Lord's Day as a festival, the Resurrection Day. See, they call him the Lord's Day. The resurrection day, Eshuin day, the queen and chief of all the days of the week. Looking forward to this, the prophet declared to the end for the eighth day on which our life both sprang up again and the victory over death was obtained in Christ, whom the children of perdition, the enemies of the Savior, deny, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things, who are lovers of pleasure and not lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. These make merchandise of Christ, corrupting his word and giving up Jesus to sell. They are corruptors of women and covetous of other men's possessions, swallowing up wealth insatiably from whom may ye be delivered by the mercy of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I ain't got no more to say to this one. I, I mean. Because <laughs> I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this. <sighs> History of the Christian Church. Now, when I was reading this, I was floored. That's why I'm going to read it to you all. Um, the source here, uh, the Christian Sabbath. This is they're calling it the Christian Sabbath, right? Uh, John T. Bailey, History of the the Sabbath. Um, these these are the 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 authors of these uh, essays and articles here, right? Um, 
you can go back and look at this. This is ccel.org. And again, I will share these links in the description box when I'm done with this lesson here. Oh, can, right? can I say one yeah. thing? Before Absolutely. You just Absolutely. On the last point, because I had highlighted some stuff in that last article. And I just want to okay. say oh, that oh. the apostles, the first century and second century believers had no problem worshiping on both the, the Shabbat and on Sunday. They had no problem doing it. In fact, they, sometimes they fellowship consistently throughout the week. But they, they didn't stop observing the Sabbath, and they had no problem worshiping on Sunday. But like I said earlier, the more Gentile the congregation or the ecclesia becomes, and the less Hebrew becomes, the more anti-Semitism grows, the new majority starts now to ostracize what had now become the minority in a lot of your your Nazarene or your 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 more Hebrew or not or Israelite believers, and they even and they try to break away from anything that's customary or reminiscent of them, and so the Sabbath now, which is biblical, begins to give place, and they use the separation of Sabbath from Sunday as the Lord's Day to actually drive that wedge between the two groups even further when that wedge didn't exist. You know, then actually believers would worship on Sunday more or less, almost you could say, as a defiance against other pagan practices that were going on on Sunday. You know, not in accord with them, but almost to let you know our 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 Elohim is greater than yours. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You know, but that all, again, would change. I'm going to let you go ahead and read what you can read. read then. That's all I want to say. Yeah, no doubt. I want to say one thing, though, real quick. Um, you said the church became more Gentile. I'm, I'm going to say this about the term Gentile. I said that the because because when when the nations, when the nations, right, come into the fold of the covenant, they're no longer Gentile because Gentile pretty much means, you know, somebody outside of yod heh wah and the covenant as a non-believer. So. Mm -hmm. I'll just I'll just say that real quick. That's all I want to say. Well, no, I, I know what you meant. No, I thought sorry. I had clarified earlier, and I said when I'm using those terms, I'm using it in terms of from a, a cultural perspective. Oh, culture, right, 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 yeah, right. Yeah. So from when I say Gentile, I'm not meaning there's a racial designation. I mean oh, we know a, that. You know, we yeah. know you ain't doing that. Doing yeah, that. as a cultural oh, designation. Yeah. In other words, new converts still thought like pagans. Right, and right. Didn't believe their paganism. Right. That part. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, part. Yeah we, yeah, we understand, Elder. We know you don't politic like that. Right. We, we, we know you don't do that. Yeah. And now we're gonna see uh to what effect you're talking about in, in this in this writing right here. Ooh to the we civil and religious Sunday. So y'all can go back and check this source out. Um uh I'm not I'm not gonna read everything right here, but these are the players involved in writing this information recording it right okay so let me read the observance of sunday originated in the time of the apostles and ever since forms the basis of public worship with its ennobling sanctifying and cheering influences in all christian lands so they're saying the they're trying to justify sunday observance saying it it originated in the time of the apostles but if you if you paid attention to what mr black tastic just said you know, there was no issue with worshiping. See, worship is an everyday thing. It's a lifestyle. It actually shows when, when you're behaving or conducting yourself in a certain manner, it, show, it shows whose allegiance to you have as a deity. I mean, it, it, shows, it shows who your deity is. It, sh it shows who you honor and pay homage to as far as what, what, what deity um, um, you are governed by. Right? That's worship. All right, let me continue. The Christian Sabbath is, on the one hand, the continuation and the regeneration of the Jewish Sabbath, Jewish Sabbath, based upon God's resting from the creation and upon the fourth commandment of the Decalogue, which, as to its substance, is not of merely national application like the ceremonial and civil law, but of universal import and perpetual validity for mankind. Over in another article, it said, hey, the Christian Sabbath is not a continuation 
of the Jewish Sabbath. They were making it a total separation, a total distinction. So now we have what? Hypocrisy. We got double tongue this right here, right? Now watch this. It is, on the other hand, a new creation of the gospel. We know it's not, but this is their talking, right? Uh, a memorial of the resurrection of Christ and of the work of redemption completed and divinely sealed thereby. It rests, we may say, upon the threefold basis of the original creation, the Jewish legislation and the Christian redemption, and is rooted in the physical, the moral, and the religious wants of our nature. It has a legal and an evangelical aspect. Like the law in general, the institution of the Christian Sabbath, right? And we know there's no such thing as Christian Sabbath, but this is what they're calling it, right? The institution of the Christian Sabbath is a wholesome restraint upon the people and a schoolmaster to lead them to Christ. <laughs> you butchering Galatians. But it is also strictly evangelical. It was originally made for the benefit of man, like the family, with which it goes back beyond the fall to the paradise of innocence as the second institution of God on earth. It was a delight to the pious of the old dispensation. Um, what are they doing? They're quoting Isaiah chapter 43. And now under the new, it is fraught with the glorious memories and blessings of Christ's resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeshua says, uh, what, what is that? Uh, I, I forget. The Sabbath. Or is it Mark chapter 2? The Sabbath was made for man. It said the Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath was made for man. But now you have the church baby daddy talking about what? They're saying the Christian Sabbath or the Sunday was was made for the benefit of men. You see how they're <laughs> twisting, twisting, warping, and distorting? You got something to say, B.A., real quick? Or, or, Let me just say this. <laughs> and get on out the way. Jesus Christ or Yeshua Hamashiach or whichever you prefer to call him was not a Christian. What we're reading here, he had no type of connection to this type of thought. Just want to say that. Let me continue. The Christian Sabbath is the ancient Sabbath baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost, regenerated, spiritualized, and glorified. See, they don't know when to take something literal spiritual, and they don't know when to take something spiritual literal. Lord have mercy. It is the connecting link of creation and redemption, of paradise lost and paradise gained and paradise regained, and a pledge of preparation for the saints' everlasting rest in heaven. The ancient church viewed the Sunday mainly, we may say, one-sidedly and exclusively from its Christian aspect as a new institution and not in any way as a continuation of the Jewish Sabbath. Anti-Semitism, right? It observed it as the day of the commemoration of the resurrection. And she went. Right? Well, watch this. It observed it as the day of commemoration of the resurrection or of the now spiritual creation and hence as a day of sacred joy and thanksgiving, standing in bold contrast to the days of humiliation and fasting, as the Easter festival co contrasts with Good Friday. <laughs> let me keep reading it. Let, let, me, let me just read this all the way. Shut up, Shanti. Let me just read this all the way. No, come on. Come on. Because we got to get through this. This is long. I'm waiting for you to get to the point, part about the, the Easter eggs or something. <laughs> we going to get to that. The way this we thing is going. <laughs> <laughs> we going to get to that. <laughs> I'm waiting for Peter yeah. Cottontail to pop up in the ring. All right. Pete, not Peter Cottontail. <laughs> And the Cadbury Bunny, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so long as Christianity was not recognized and protected by the state, okay. I need y'all to pay attention to this because Mr. Black Tastics alluded to something about this earlier, right? When he said Christian, being a Christian, and Christian dome or Christianity is not the same thing. Watch this. So long as Christianity was not recognized and protected by the state, the observance of Sunday was purely religious, a strictly voluntary service, but exposed to continual interruption from the bustle of the world and the hostile community. The pagan Romans paid no more regard to the Christian Sunday than to the Jewish Sabbath. 
in this matter, as in others, the accession of Constantine, Roman Emperor Constantine, marks the beginning of a new era. Okay, Constantine, the accession of Constantine, the Roman Emperor, marks the beginning of a new era and did good service to the church and to the cause of public order and morality. So he finna do something, because it was what? Before a strictly voluntary search. I, right? I, I'm waiting for you to read this next part. It's so good. Constantine. Constantine is the founder, in part at least, of the civil observance of Sunday, by which alone the religious observance of it in the church could be made universal and could be properly secured. Huh? In the year 321, three, in the year 321 CE, he, Constantine, issued a law prohibiting manual labor in the cities and all judicial transactions at a later period also military exercises on Sunday. Why? We're we going to see that right now. He exempted the liberation of slaves, which as an act of Christian humanity and charity might, with special propriety, take place on that day. But the Sunday law of Constantine must not be overrated. He enjoined... Oh my... Okay. This is the part. He enjoined... Who is he? Constantine. He enjoined the observance, or rather forbade, the public desecration of Sunday, not under the name of Sabbatum or Dies Domini, but under its old astrological and heathen title, Dies Solis. Day of the Sun, S-U-N. Familiar to all his subjects. Oh, familiar to all his subjects. Huh? So that the law was as applicable to the worshipers of Hercules, Apollo, and Mithras as to the Christians. Let, mm. let me highlight this. Let me highlight this. <laughs> That this oh. oh my goodness, this is the part I really was waiting waiting for us to get to. Do y'all <laughs> see this? Do y'all see this? Let me say it again. Do y'all see this? I'm getting happy now. I'm finna get like BA, Mr. Black Task. <laughs> Mr. Black Tassie wanted to talk about DS Solis about an hour ago. <laughs> right? And I was like, hold on, I got you, brother. I said, hold on, we're gonna give you an E flat with this. We're gonna let you preach in a minute. <laughs> but I got I got to harp on this for right quick. In the year 321, Constantine, he did this. He instituted Sunday. Why? He instituted it. Why? So he could take the title of Dia Solis, Day of the S-U-N, that was familiar to everybody who was what? Worshippers of Hercules, Apollo, and Mithras, as to the Christians. Right? So he got the Christians doing what the pagans do. Hmm? He got to make things more comfortable for the pagans. Mm -hmm. Good grief. Okay. The, the, the stones and the bricks are coming, B.A. The brick shower. I know it's coming. It's coming to Ashanti. So this <laughs> answers the question. Shanti. Sis, we, we, take, huh? we take those we take those bricks and those stones and we turn them into powder over here. And then and then blow it back on them like blow it right back <laughs> on them. He's, ain't nobody, nobody over here flinching. No, nobody's right? flinching over here. Oh my gosh. Okay, let, let me continue to read this. And then I'm going to let y'all talk. And then we got one more to read after this. <sighs> there is no reference, whatever in his law, either to the fourth commandment or to the resurrection of Christ. Let me say that again. There is no reference, whatever in his law for Sunday, right? either to the fourth commandment, so it ain't got nothing to do with the fourth commandment, or to the resurrection of Christ. 
Besides, he expressly exempted the country districts where paganism still prevailed from the prohibition of labor and thus avoided every appearance of injustice. There was paganism still going on, like Mr. Black Tastic said. Christians and pagans had been accustomed to festival rest. So, so what does he do? Mr. Black Tastic said it best. This is where the syncretism is, the infusion. This is why Christians today think they are not pagans. Now, now when, you, when huh? you get ready to read the rest, though, I want people to take notice of in the retelling of this history, how they try to fix it to make it sound like it's okay. And this is what I say. It's amazing yeah. to me that they documented these deviations and tried to give it a favorable light as if yeah. it was right. But, right. but go ahead, read, sis. All right. And shalom to my brother Anon. Shalom, good to have you here. I appreciate that. You know what I mean. If you're gonna act as our shield, or you're gonna you're gonna put up, you're gonna you're gonna make a shield for us, so we won't get hit by them bricks. All right, I got you. I got you. <laughs> All right, let me continue. Constantine made these rests to synchronize, right? The rest of the Christians and the pagans. Constantine made these rests to synchronize. And gave the preference to Sunday, on which day Christians from the beginning celebrated the resurrection of their Lord and Savior. This and no more was implied in the famous enactment of 321 CE. It was only a step in the right direction, but probably the one, probably the only one which Constantine could prudently or safely take at that period of transition from the rule of paganism to that of Christianity. See, the thing is, if you can't beat them, join them. Mm -hmm. If you can't beat paganism, join them, but act like you ain't doing no paganism. We just going to say, hey, y'all want to call the Sunday the Resurrection Day? Oh, we comfortable with that day, too. You know why? Because, you know, we familiar with Hercules and Apollo and Mithras. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just both go ahead and, you know. <sighs> that's what, they, that, that's the, what you said is exactly what happened. Because that's exactly how the devil operates. If I if he tries to first stamp you out, if he can't stamp you out, then he infiltrates you and tries to destroy you from the inside out. And that's exactly what you see happening here with Constantine getting involved. You know, whenever the government starts to dictate and monitor to your spiritual or religious system. Your spiritual religious system is no longer of God. It's of the government. Yeah. And that's why even in ancient Israel, the king could not <laughs> usurp authority over the priesthood because if they tried to do things that were out of order, the Lord punished them. King Uzziah, the longest reigning Israelite king beside, I think, Manasseh, he went in and tried to offer incense and got stricken with leprosy. And had to live in a sick house for the last part of his reign. So you, you couldn't step over the boundaries. No more than the priests weren't supposed to go in and take over the throne. But the priests had actually as much authority, if not more, than the king. Because they could also, along with the prophets, correct kings. And they also sometimes were used to save kingly lines such as when Athaliah was on the throne and had tried to destroy all the seed royal and you had a priest that had to step in and protect them and so but whenever you have the government in charge you don't have a religious system anymore you got a mess yeah, yeah. all right let me continue all right for the army however uh, Constantine, he went beyond the limits of negative and protective legislation to which the state ought to confine itself in matters of religion and enjoined a certain positive observance of Sunday in requiring the Christian soldiers to attend Christian worship and the heathen soldiers in the open field at a given signal with eyes and hands raised towards heaven to recite the following certainly very indefinite form of prayer. Thee alone we acknowledge as God Thee we reference as king, to thee we call as our helper. 
To thee we owe our victories. By thee have we obtained the mastery of our enemy. To thee we give thanks for the benef for benefits already received. From thee we hope for benefits to come. We all fall at thy feet and fervently beg that thou wouldest preserve to us our Emperor Constantine and his divinely beloved sons in long life, healthful, and victorious. All right. Constantine's successors pursued the Sunday legislation which he had initiated and gave a legal sanction and civil significance also to other holy days of the church, which have no spiritual, excuse me, let me say that again. Constantine's successors pursued the Sunday legislation, which he had initiated and gave a legal sanction and civil significance also to other holy days of the church, which have no scriptural authority <laughs> so that the special reverence due to the Lord's day was obscured in proportion as the number of rival claims increase. They say they have no scriptural authority. Because they don't. Thus, Theodosius I increased the number of judi judicial holidays to 124. The Valentinians uh, uh, 1 and 2 prohibited the exaction of taxes and the collection of monies on Sunday and enforced the previously enacted prohibition of lawsuits. Theodosius the Great in 386 CE, and still more stringently, the younger Theodosius in 425 CE forbade theatrical performances, and Leo Anthemius in 460 CE prohibited other secular amusements on the Lord's Day. You see, everybody starts changing by the Lord's Day. Why do y'all go to church, dress up on Sunday? This is why. All right? Such laws, however, were probably never rigidly executed. A Council of Carthage in 401 or 401 CE laments the people's passion for theatrical and other entertainments on Sunday. The same abuse, it is well known, very generally prevails to this day upon the continent of Europe in both Protestant and Roman Catholic countries, and Christian princes and magistrates only too frequently give it the sanction of their example. Ecclesiastical legislation in like manner prohibited needless mechanical and agricultural labor and the attending of theaters and other public places of amusement, also hunting and weddings on Sunday and on feast days. Besides such negative legislation to which the state must confine itself, the church at the same time enjoined positive observances for the sacred day, especially the regular attendance of public worship, frequent communion, and the payment of free will offerings or tithes. We call them free will right? Uh, many a council here confounded the legal and the evangelical principles thinking themselves able to enforce by the threatening of penalties what has moral value only as a voluntary act. The Council of Eliberus in 305 CE decreed the suspension from communion of any person living in a town who shall absent himself for three Lord's days from church. <laughs> In the same legalistic spirit, oh, it's a legalistic spirit? Yeah, okay. In the same legalistic spirit, the Council of Sardica in 343 CE and the Trulin Council of 692 CE threatened with deposition the clergy who should unnecessarily omit public worship three Sundays in secession and prescribe temporary excommunication for similar neglect among the laity. So that you see these Sunday laws popping off and they talk about, oh, if you ain't attending Sunday services, you might have some, you know, we might have some punishments or some, you know, things coming down, right? But on the other hand, the councils, while they turned the Lord's Day itself into a legal ordinance handed down from the apostles, pronounced with all decision against the Jewish Sabbatism, right? Let me continue to read. The Apostolic Canons and the Council of Gangra, the latter about 450 CE, in opposition to the Gnostic Manichaean ascetism of the, um, uh, what is that, Eustathians, condemn fasting on Sunday. In the Greek church, this prohibition is still enforced because Sunday, commemorating the resurrection of Christ, is a day of spiritual joy. On the same, uh, on the same symbolical ground, kneeling in prayer was forbidden on Sunday and through the whole time of Easter until Pentecost. The General Council of Nicaea in 325 CE issued on this point in the 20th canon of the following decision. Whereas some bow the knee on Sunday 
And on the days of Pentecost, for example, during the seven weeks after Easter, the Holy Council that everything may uh, that everything may everywhere be uniform decrees that prayers be offered to God in a standing posture. See, if they already knew the Hebraic culture, they already knew sometimes. I mean, sometimes we stood in prayer, sometimes we kneeled in prayer. But now they try to make laws, specific laws about every little thing. This this is wild. This is wild. Mm -hmm. All right, let me continue. The Trulin Council in 692 CE ordained in the 19th canon from Saturday evening to Sunday evening, let no one bow the knee. The Roman church in general still adheres to this practice. The New Testament gives no law for such secondary matters. The Apostle Paul, on the contrary, just in the season of Easter and Pentecost, before his imprisonment, following an inward dictate, repeatedly knelt in prayer. So they're trying to they're trying to make everything justifiable by saying, oh, you know, Apostle Paul, he was in jail. He knelt down in prayer during this time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> if if y'all would have understood the, the text of the culture, the, the teachings from the original apostles anyway, none of this stuff would have had to happen. All right, exactly. let me continue. I mean, you, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, again, they, they show the Trulin Council which tells people they can't bow their knees. And then they also document the fact that the scripture contradicts that. And so you see men inserting their own laws yep. to override. They're doing the very thing Christ accused the Pharisees and Sadducees of. Right. They're teaching the, the doctrines of men right. as the commandments of the Most High. And they're even quoting yep. the, the, the apostles and prophets and then deviating from what they just quoted. I mean, right. it's, <laughs> this is amazing. Right. B.A., yeah, you good over there? Good over there? All right. Uh, I want to say shalom to Sister Regina. I want to say shalom to Apostle Curtis. Thank you all for joining in. Till die. Till die. All right. The Council of Orleans in 538 CE says in the 28th canon, it is Jewish superstition that one may not ride or walk on Sunday, nor do anything to adorn the house or the person. What? But occupations in the field are forbidden that people may come to the church and give themselves to prayer. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. <laughs> I'm sorry you mean to say that. I just had that. I couldn't hold it in. So I said, what? You sound like, you sound like a little child. What? What? Yeah. What? <laughs> you know, when, uh, when Dave Chappelle was imitating, right. he, he was saying it like a question. What? <laughs> That's what you said. Cause, yeah, because this dude, they might be oh. hard Sunday. So they didn't have those. <laughs> You, well, at least they put this in quotes to say that somebody said this. They didn't say that it was right. necessarily true because we know right. this is not true. Right. It says the, it's the Jewish superstition. You but, know what I'm saying? But you see yeah. the hint of what I was talking about earlier, the anti-Semitism yep. that comes out. It's Now it's shifting to, well, blame a Jew. <laughs> Just blame a Jew. Because if you go and look at more historical documents, that really became almost like a mantra because it was like blame a jew they killed jesus they did this they it, every that's how the anti-semitism yep, really yep, yep, developed that's, yep that's how so everything they thought was wrong or that they didn't want to be accountable for that they wanted to change they somehow blamed the people that actually gave them the gospel and of whom the messiah was from right so you're gonna blame the people that the messiah actually came from why y'all sitting up here also promoting these <laughs> pagan doctrines of eating it, actually eating his his blood and, and right. drinking his blood and flesh, not doing it in remembrance, but thinking you actually eating him. Right. You know, <laughs> and so <laughs> they want to eat the Jewish Jesus, but they don't want the Jewish people that the Jesus came from that they worship. I mean, this right. is crazy. They, they want all the benefits. They want all the benefits. Like this, this is this is prompting me to probably do a more thorough study 
on actually how old crack is. Because I think the Roman Empire was all doing crack. <laughs> I mean, this is this is crazy stuff, but you know, the, it's the history. It's right. the history, and they, they recorded it even against their own selves. You know, they wanna they wanna come into the house. But don't want to follow the rules. Yeah, you better come on. How you go? How you go come into somebody? You know, my grandmother used to say, and my, my great grandmother used to say, "How you gonna walk into somebody's house and not announce yourself and speak to the people who live there?" Right. Mm-hmm. That's the rules. Come on, and then not adhere to the rules of the house. Who house are we walking into? You walking into the Most High's house, and right. his priests are Israel, and you gonna sit back and tell me you can walk in and just not acknowledge the Most High? And just not acknowledge his people and say we're gonna come in and we just gonna start our own little thing in the Lord's house. And we're gonna give all the we're gonna get all the benefits. You're gonna give us all the benefits. And, and, and if you and don't give it, we're gonna take yeah. it. They acted like uh they acted like BB Siegel. You're gonna get down or lay down. Go ahead, right. Jay. <laughs> right. yeah. and, and, and most high, you gonna and you gonna do it too. And Israel, you better sit back and not say nothing either. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is you know, like I said, if the intent of those who were originally cataloging and documenting these things was just to record history as it is, then their endeavor I applaud. But if the intent of others was to document this history to try and embellish the truth and just skew things a certain way, then that's sinister and devious. And this is the greatest example of self-snitching I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Because they telling you, we messed it all up. I mean, they didn't think they messed up. They thought they was doing the right thing, you know. They thought they was doing Spike Lee. And they they looked pompous doing it to me. But yeah. Well, you know what? Okay. It's, it's not, it wasn't just the right. They thought they were doing a better thing. Mm. So mm. That's, that's making yourself an idol. This is better. So you yeah. better than the founders and the originators who laid the foundation, you know, and the Christ himself. It's better. It's That's better. arrogance. That's straight yeah. arrogance, would you call it? Mm-hmm. Supreme arrogance. You know, I know better than Jesus. I know better than God. You know, let's help him. Let's put this together. He, he, he missed this part. You know, Jesus, you missed a spot right there. That's basically what that <laughs> you know? This is wild. All right, let, let me continue. All right. As to the private opinions of the principal fathers on this subject, they all favor the sanctification of the Lord's day, but treat it as a peculiarly, uh, peculiarly Christian institution and draw a strong indeed a too strong line of distinction between it and the Jewish Sabbath, forgetting that they are one in essence and aim, though different in form and spirit, and that the fourth commandment as to a substance, vis-a-vis the keeping holy of one day out of seven, is an integral part of the Decalogue or the moral law, and hence a perpetual obligation. So there is some people here like, wait a minute. These people forgetting here. (laughs) A little bit of what's going on in the fourth commandment. All right. So Eusebius calls Sunday, but not the Sabbath, the seventh day, the first and chief of days and a day of salvation and commends Constantine for commanding that all assemble together every week. And keep that which is called the Lord's Day as a festival to refresh even their bodies and to stir up their minds by divine precepts and instruction. Athanasius speaks very highly of the Lord's Day, S-U-N Day, as the perpetual memorial of the resurrection, but assumes that the old Sabbath has deceased. Another name, Athanasius. So we got Athanasius, Tertullian. Barnabas, Ignatius, right? Well, you know, Eusebius was Constantine's boy. I don't think a lot of people know that. So, of course, he would say something like this. He was a historian. 
and you know a theologian but he was also close to constantine you know <laughs> i think people were well, a lot of if, unless you research history a lot of people wouldn't know that right on they better go research now all right let me continue macarius a presbyter of upper egypt spiritualizes the sabbath as a type and shadow of the true sabbath given by the lord to the soul the true and eternal sabbath which is freedom from sin i do agree with that hillary represents the whole uh hillary represents the whole of this life as a preparation for the eternal sabbath for of the next epiphanius speaks of sunday as an institution of the apostles but falsely attributes the same origin to the observance of Wednesday and Friday as half fast. So Epiphanius is in error because Sunday, we don't see it was instituted by the original apostle. We just do not. Right? Ambrose frequently mentions Sunday as an evangelical festival and contrasts it with the defunct legal Sabbath. They call it defunct. Right? Remember, Sabbath, when they're using the word Sabbath alone, that's the seventh day of the week. Jerome makes the same distinction. He relates of the Egyptian um, Kohenobites that they devote themselves on the Lord's day to nothing but prayer and reading the scriptures. But he mentions also without censure that the pious Paula and her companions, after returning from church on Sundays, applied themselves to their allotted works and made garments for themselves and others. See, remember these names or, you know, look up these names. Look up these these, these players, I was saying, in, in these in, in this heresy, I would say, right? Augustine likewise directly derived Sunday from the resurrection and not from the fourth commandment. <sighs> Lord have mercy. Fasting on that day of spiritual joy, he regards like Ambrose as a grave scandal and heretical practice. The, the uh, apost uh, ap apostolical, is that how you say that? The, uh, uh, the uh, uh, apostolical constitutions in this respect, go even still further and declare, he that fasts on the Lord's day is guilty of sin. But they still prescribe the celebration of the Jewish Sabbath on Saturday in addition to the Christian Sunday. Mm. See, this is, this is what you was talking about mm -hmm. right here a little bit, right? Uh, uh, Brother Black Tastic, when you were saying, hey, back in the, back in the way back, they did. They, uh, uh, our uh, our brother in here, the the original apostles, didn't see anything, see anything wrong with worshiping, um, on Sabbath and Sunday. Right. 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 All right. Let right. me continue. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was saying. I was saying they. Yeah. They. They never. They never stopped observing the Sabbath, and they had no problem worshiping on Sunday. Also. Right. So they. They never put Sunday over the Sabbath either. Right. See here, you got, you got these these politicians in position, like the Roman emperor, and and these these church fathers or church baby daddies putting themselves in their own authority, talking about, hey, Lord's Day, Lord's Day, Sunday, that's the resurrection, so everybody got to start worshiping there. Well, if you don't, and if you fast on that day, you guilty of sin. Is 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 there a sin written? Is is it in the text a sin? That if you if you fast on on the first day of the week, the sin. <laughs> I mean, because I don't see it. I don't see it. There's absolutely nothing. Right. Let you me can continue. fast on the Sabbath. Yeah, you can fast on the Sabbath. Come on. Man. I mean, like Yom Hakipurim is considered a Sabbath. We definitely afflict our beings by fasting. You know. See, this again. This is what happens when you don't know the culture and you try to insert yourself as somebody knowing better. Right. The culture, right? This, this, right. This, is, this, is, this is crazy. All right, let me well, continue. The funny thing is they try uh -huh. to make themselves the new apostles or the new Levites, mm -hmm. but all they actually did was make themselves the new Sadducees and Pharisees who withstood yep. Christ. Man, and that's what, I, that's what the modern day church seems like to me is a bunch of Pharisees because they want their traditions. They want their traditions over everything. It's like tradition is a hell of a drug. 
Let me let me <laughs> let me let me continue. Chrysostom warns Christians against sabbatizing with the Jews. So what he's saying, Chrysostom is saying, hey, don't be don't don't be observing the seven day Sabbath, right? So Chrysostom warns Christians against sabbatizing with the Jews, but earnestly commends the due celebration of the Lord's Day Sunday. Leo the Great, in a beautiful passage, the finest of all the patristic utterances on this subject, lauds the Lord's Day as the day of the primitive creation, of the Christian redemption, of the meeting of the risen Savior with the assembled disciples, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, of the principal divine blessings bestowed upon the world. <laughs> Dang. But he likewise brings it in no connection with the fourth commandment and with the other fathers leaves out of view the proper foundation of the day in the eternal moral law of God. See, there, there's apostasy, straying away from the word of the Lord God of Israel. Apostasy. This is it, you guys. All right. Besides Sunday, the Jewish Sabbath also was distinguished in the Eastern Church by the absence of fasting and by standing in prayer. The Western Church, or on the contrary, especially the Roman in protest against Judaism, observed the seventh day of the week as a fast day like Friday. So this difference between the two churches was permanently fixed by the 55th canon of the Trulin Council of 692 CE. In Rome, fasting is practiced on all the Saturdays of, uh, what is that? Quadragesima, the 40 days fast before Easter. Lent. This is contrary. I pause there for a reason, y'all. All right. <laughs> this is contrary, huh? Look at all the extra introductions of. They start to introduce more documents than the our Jewish forefathers ever did. Yes, we had the Talmud and, and, and yeah, this could be their oral law, right? Right, but they're right, and they introduce so many new doctrines. Yep. Over the next 700 or, or the next 400 years, yep. you know, when we get to the 8th century or the last ecumenical council, that it, it, it actually will be shocking. Nobody I know, whether they are seminary student or professor, you know, or the Archbishop of McDonald's, Golden Arches, <laughs> knows all these doctrines and different documents that have been produced because that's just how many of them there are. It, it, you can't even keep up with the count right. that they kept producing yep. all this like legislation in our government. You know, and this is why I say, again, this is another evidence of when I say Catholicism and modern day Christianity are in essence the same thing. This is not the Christian faith of the scriptures. This is a political geopolitical system that is a pseudo faith made by men they do not worship christ he's not the center or focus of the religion it because men are because it's a political system it's a social political system that only uses religion as a cover to subvert its true intentions these are enemies of the cross and of Christ, as Paul said, and that's what, but this now, where it was just a few people in the apostles' day, this is a global system, and it's headquarters, I mean, it's, think about this, in all the religions, you have Islam, which has Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem as its three most holiest cities, with Mecca being considered preeminent, but in Islam, you don't have a one congruent collective, so to speak. And even in many of your reform Protestant denominations and things, so, so to speak, is the same way with Hinduism, Buddhism. I mean, you have the Dalai Lama for certain things. But of all of the other religious systems on earth, only one of them actually has a legitimate capital city with a government that prints its own money has ambassadors in the UN and is tied into every economic or political system in the world. And that's headquartered in Rome, and it's the Vatican. They have diplomatic immunity. 
They're the only religious system that is also a government, an official government. And you see its establishment taking place. This is the bricks being laid down to establish that foundation in the history that we're reading right now. Right. All right, so let me let me continue. All right, so this is contrary to the 66 apostolic canon and must no longer be done. Whoever does it, if a clergyman, shall be deposed. If a layman, excommunicated. All right. Wednesday and Friday also continue to be observed in many countries as days commemorative of the Passion of Christ, right? The, the death, burial, and resurrection, right? We have fasting. The Latin church, however, gradually substituted fasting on Saturday for fasting on Wednesday. Right? It's, it's amazing they got this Wednesday in here because, to me, they know something's up, you know, with this Friday thing versus Wednesday. Let me continue. Finally, as to the daily devotions, the number of uh, canonical hours was enlarged from 3 to 7. Um, a large from 3 to 7 because it says in, uh, what is that? <sighs> I'm not good with the the room the 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 numbers, but what's that? Psalms 164. Seven times in a day will I praise thee, but they were strictly kept only in the cloisters under the technical names of Matina about three o'clock, Prima about six, Tertia nine, Sexta noon, Nona three in the afternoon, Vesper six. Uh, Psalm 119. I'm sorry. I, I'm, oh, Psalm 119. Okay. Yes. Psalms 119. Okay, my bad. Compla Complatorium nine and Messonitium or Vigilia Midnight. Uh, usually two nocturnal prayers were united. The devotions consisted of prayer, singing, scripture reading, especially in the Psalms, and readings from the histories of the martyrs and the homilies of the fathers. In the churches, ordinarily, only morning and evening worship was held. The high festivals were introduced by a night service of vigils. All right. So that's that for the 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 history of the Christian church, pretty much Sunday. You know, why, why Sunday came to be uh, legislated as the universal day for all Christians, so to speak, to, to, to worship, right? They said, we're not going to do the seventh-day Sabbath. That's the Jew stuff. We separated from the Jew. We're going to do this, and we're going to get Roman Emperor Constantine. Constantine's going to make it legislation. That's that. This is Sunday. So like B.A. said in the very beginning of this live here, B.A. said, hey, take this back to your Christian friends, especially the ones who go to church on Sunday. Ask them if they know about this. Right? All right. Lastly, we're going to close out. Hopefully it doesn't take an hour. <laughs> right? But we've been on here since two, two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. Right? Um which is not a, not a bad time at all. Not a bad time at all. But we're seeing why communion, why we, we, we got it established as to why the church is doing communion or taking the juice and the crackers, right, and doing it on Sunday, whatever, how, how, however many Sundays they want to do it, right? We're seeing why they're doing the communion on Sunday, right? And then we're seeing why Sunday. We're seeing why Sunday, why it's got to be on Sunday, right? But we established this Eucharist here, this Thanksgiving, it wasn't by the, the disciples and the early apostles as something to celebrate as far as the resurrection of Christ. When Christ, Yeshua, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me again, it was commemorating that the firstborn of Israel were spared from being killed in the 10th plague before the Exodus. As we saw in Paradosis Part 1 in Tractate Sophrodim 21. Right. And all, can I just add something? And also, yes. um, his death as the sacrificial lamb, you know, so to speak, as they say, you know, the blood passing over them. In other words, the sacrifice that he was about to make for them, as the apostle said, you do show the Lord's death until, until he comes. So you have 
another revelation wrapped up in why they were doing that because this is what he was getting ready to do for them. He was getting ready to do for them spiritually what had been done for them coming out of Egypt. Only they wouldn't need to put blood on the doorpost. He was going to give himself as the lamb for their, for, for their sins and be the blood that would cover them and free them spiritually from spiritual Egypt before the bondage of sin. This is good to go back into. I know it's long. It's extensive. It's right, but it's tight. Right? All right. B.A., you still there? B.A., you still there? You just had to step away. B.A. probably had to step away. All right. All right. So we're going um, we to continue this thing out and then wrap it on up here. Uh, before I do, I want to say shalom. Shalom, Lakol, to everyone who's still coming in. Rebuke and repute rebuke and reprove. Don't know if you're a male or female, let me know. Uh anyone else coming in? I'll say shalom to you. All right, let me continue. So this is the last of uh what I want to get to here. Um it's not as long and extensive as what I just read. But this is this is more of when when Mr. Black Tastic says more of the when the nations are coming in, when the nations are coming in and they are just learning about this culture here, sometimes they, they, they run amok and don't really take heed to what's being taught to them and they think they know better. And so um, that, that's, that's what you're getting, right? And so remember, we were talking about one of the first councils that was going on, um, the Council of Nicaea. It was to determine the deity of Yeshua, the deity of Christ, and it also determined the day of Easter. Now, Easter is is a mistranslation in your KJV, right? It's actually from from the pagan word, which honors the the spring goddess pretty much. It it honors the pagan spring goddess. Okay. Um. What what the Hebraic culture knows is Passover, unleavened bread. All right? All right. So let me read this here, and then we're done. Uh, the yearly festivals of this period were Easter, Pentecost, and Epiphany. They'll let us know what Epiphany is. <laughs> they form the rudiments of the church year and keep within the limits of the facts of the New Testament. Strictly speaking, the anti-Nicene church had two annual festive seasons, Passover in commemoration of the suffering of Christ and the Pentecost in commemoration of the resurrection and exaltation of Christ, beginning with Easter and ending with Pentecost proper. Now, some things they got right, some things they didn't get right. Um, let me continue. But Passover and Easter were connected in a continuous celebration, combining the deepest sadness with the highest joy, and hence the term Pascha in Greek and Latin is often used in a wider sense for the Easter season, as is the case with the French um, and the Italian. So Pacera Pakis, I don't know how you say that in Italian, Pascha, right? So they're saying there's something continuous. We know they're not. It's two different things. Two totally different things. All right. The Jewish Passover, which we know is not the Jewish Passover, it's the Most High's Passover, right? It says the Jewish Passover also lasted a whole week. So the Feast of Eleven Bread, right? It lasted a whole week, and after it began their Pentecost or Feast of Weeks, right? You count seven weeks, and then that's forty-nine days. Then the day after is the fiftieth day, right? The death of Christ became fruitful in the resurrection. And has no redemptive power without it. So, um, Pentecost, the Shavuot, and the 40 days after Yeshua resurrected, pretty much that's when the ascension happened. So that's what they're equating that to, right? They're equating the ascension and the resurrection. I don't know how, but just crazy. 
But anyway, the commemoration of the death of Christ was called the Pascha Staro Simon, or the Passover proper. This is what the church fathers are calling this, right? Not the text. You don't see nothing in the, in the New Testament that alludes to this, right? The commemoration of the resurrection was called the Pascha uh, Anastasimon and afterwards Easter. Remember, I said Easter is a pagan word. It's pretty much the name for the pagan goddess, right? You know the disciples and the apostles had nothing to do with a pagan goddess nor would they rename one of the most highest festivals and feasts after a pagan goddess. It's just not going to happen. All right. The former corresponds to the gloomy Friday, the other to the cheerful Sunday, the sacred days of the week in commemoration of those great events. The Christian Passover naturally grew out of the Jewish Passover as the Lord's Day grew out of the Sabbath. Y'all hear this? This, this? this is crazy. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine saying these things. This is like blasphemy, right? Uh, the Paschal Lamb being regarded as a prophetic type of Christ, the Lamb of God slain for our sins, and the deliverance from the bondage of Egypt as a type of the redemption from sin. Now that part is is cool, but you don't you don't grow Christian Passover out of Jewish Passover, and you don't grow the Lord's Day out of the Sabbath. Such thing as a Christian Passover, no such thing as a Jewish Passover. It's just a Passover, you know. Uh, it is certainly the oldest and most important annual festival of the church, and can be traced back to the first century, or at all events to the middle of the second when it was universally observed, though with a difference as to the day and the extent of the fast connected with it. It is based on the view that Christ crucified and risen is the center of faith. Right? They're saying this this practice goes back to the first century. Well, the Passover, we know, goes back <laughs> way beyond. But this is what happens when you come into this culture. You don't know it. You're not really paying attention to the instructors who who, who gave it because they're, they're nowhere to be found. They're all gone. Who's that? Can, can I add something, Shanti? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we were talking about earlier Look at the divisive words. The, yep. Well, from we went from the Christian Sabbath versus the Jewish Sabbath to the Christian Passover now. Right. Versus the Jewish Passover. So you see, in, even in the recording of history, the anti-Semitism to always boil bubbles up to the top to try and continue to make this distinction. And what in essence, what they're saying is. Anything that Jewish believers were doing is not the right thing to do. Yeah. Because they're still practicing, in essence, Jewish customs. And there's other documents that we not we can't bring to the light right now because it would take too much time. Well, I mean, you have these church baby daddies literally blaming the Jews, the Hebrew people, for the death of Christ and all these other things. Because they have to justify their anti-Semitism yep. by making us into the villains so that that way it justifies all these subsequent actions they're going to take after that, even to the very point of saying that we, we can't be saved if we keep doing this stuff and kicking us out. And so <laughs> this is, oh man, I hope. It's like replacement theology. Yeah, it, it, it is. Ooh, goodness, girl, this is replacement theology time. This replacement theology, of, this shows you how it developed. Right, it right. Literally replacing all the customs, practices, and the people eventually. So this can't, you know, I mean, this is, this is amazing. I hope everybody that's listening, when she puts <laughs> these links up, please go to these links, save them into your browser, read this information, because it's great historical information um, that you should be aware of, and it will only enhance your education and your knowledge, and it will give you a better understanding of why things are the way they are. And this is not written by the only nobody tell you, all the Hebrew Israelites wrote that and put it on the script. The Israelites, no, there's no angry Israelites put this on. Right. This is written by Christians who call themselves or consider themselves to be 
the orthodoxy. In other words, the ones who get everything right. That's where this is coming from, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but they, they want to replace how they're doing things, but they want the benefits as well. All man. right, let me continue. Crazy, man. Woo. Uh, the Jewish Christians, they call them Jewish Christians. Lord, okay. You should have said <laughs> The Jewish Christians would very naturally from the beginning continue to celebrate the legal Passover. What are they calling it the legal Passover? Okay. The Jewish Christians would very naturally from the beginning continue to celebrate the legal Passover, but in the light of its fulfillment by the sacrifice of Christ and would dwell chiefly on the aspect of the crucifixion. Right? So they're saying that if you were born a Jew or converted to, to Judaism or whatever, right, Second Temple Judaism, they would say, that they're saying, hey, you would continue the legal pass, you would continue the Passover, that's what you've been doing, right? Then they're going to say the Gentile Christian, the Gentile Christians for whom the Jewish Passover had no meaning except through reflection from the cross would chiefly celebrate the Lord's resurrection as they did on every Sunday of the week. Okay, so Real quick, let me talk about the term Gentile Christians. Gentile really meant in the first century those who did not believe in the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right? That's what Gentile meant. So when when the nations converted over into the covenant of the Most High, yod heh wah through Yeshua, they were no longer Gentiles. They are no longer non-believers. They're believers. So calling so continuing to call them Gentile it's just it's a farce. Mm -hmm. All right. And see, this is why, again, Sunday, S U N Day. What what did Constantine do? Constantine syncretized S U N worship of, of Mithras and Apollos and Hercules with with people who wanted to celebrate the, res the resurrection of Yeshua Jesus on Sunday. Yep, he made a big, a big stew of, of religious mess. Yeah, so when people, when they're traditionally doing what they're doing in a service on SUN day, even though they don't think it is idolatry, it is. They might not be intending to do it. That might not be their heart. That might not be what 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 chiefly is on their heart, mind, soul, and spirit. That's what they're doing. We're not yeah. saying you can't worship on Sunday. Worship on Sunday. Thing is, when you go into these services <laughs> and you doing what's deemed by these church fathers, syncretized with paganism, there. That's what's going on. Yeah. All right, let me continue. Easter formed at first the beginning of the Christian year as the month of Nisan, which contained the vernal equinox corresponding to our March or April, began the sacred year of the Jews. Between the celebration of the death and the resurrection of Christ lay the great Sabbath, on which also the Greek church fasted by way of exception and the Easter vigils, which were kept with special devotion by the whole congregation till the break of day, and kept the more um, scrupulously, as it was generally believed that the Lord's glorious return would occur on this night. Right? <laughs> I don't know if y'all caught that. Easter formed at the first, the beginning of the Christian year, the vernal equinox, which contained the vernal equinox. So in Israel, when you hear certain Israelites today talking about, oh, yeah, all we got to do is look to the vernal equinox to determine this. Not necessarily the vernal equinox. Um, you know, our our ancestors understood how to look at the 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 constellation, the sun and the moon to tell the time. Right? That's how they did. But now you got these people talking about well Easter here, the beginning of the Christian year. 
mm-hmm. as the month of the Nissan. They, see, th- th- there goes this separation again. Oh, Christian year. What is a Christian year? Oh, we're, oh, it's like y'all's. We're like y'all. We're just going to call ours Easter. Y'all can call y'all Sabbath. You know. But mm. let, me, let me say uh, shalom, mm. shalom. Brother Zay, Dr. God, hop and see what's happening. What's up, Brother Zay, Doc? Glad you, glad you oh, tapped in for a hot second. For a hot second. All <laughs> right. Good to see I see also our brother Ryan Harris, also Israel. And I said, I think I said hello earlier to my sister Regina and my brother Ernest Higgs and everybody else in the chat. Our brother Anonymous. Yep. And everybody in Apostle Curtis. And I missed all the names, so I can't say all the names. Just shalom to everybody. Shalom. All the people, oh. <laughs> right? Hello and blessings, family, wherever you're at. Right. The BA so, saying something, BA, you on a mute. BA, you on mute. You gotta take yourself off mute. Okay. All right. All right. We we gonna give him a a, a chance to get get his uh. Technical apparatuses together. All right, so the Feast of the Resurrection, which completed the whole work of redemption, became gradually the most prominent part of the Christian Passover and identical with Easter. Like I said, there's no such thing as Christian Passover, it's just a Passover, but there is no Easter. There's no Easter. James, Peter, Paul, the disciples, and the nations who converted over into this way through Yeshua to the Most High Yod Heh they were no longer celebrating anything pagan. That's what it meant to convert. Amen. That's what it meant to take on the covenant. But you got these church fathers here trying to establish what? Syncretism because they want to make things palatable for the pagans who they can't beat. They can't beat the pagans out. Right? So it says, but the crucifixion continued to be celebrated on what is called Good Friday. Yeah, say say that right now. You didn't say it with the with the moan. <laughs> good Friday. You gotta say it right now. Right. Oh, Good Friday. Right. <laughs> so this is the Easter, but it has nothing to do with what the Most High set up, with what Yeshua set up. Or excuse me, what what Yeshua reiterated from the Most High, and what the disciples and the apostles kept reiterating that came from the Most High Yohei Wahei. Easter has nothing to do with that. Nothing. They established that at the Council of Nicaea. All right. Let me continue and finish up here. The Paschal feast was preceded by a season of penitence and fasting, which culminated in the Holy Week. This fasting varied in length in different countries from one day or 40 hours to six weeks. But after the 5th century, after the 5th century, through the influence of Rome, it was universally fixed at 40 days. With reference to the 40 days fasting of Christ in the wilderness and the Old Testament types of that event, the fasting of Moses and Elias. So that's where, I mean... They have established the, the, the fasting of, of, of Lent, but there is no reference to any disciple, apostle trying to fast for 40 days. <laughs> Especially, they wouldn't say, oh, we're trying to commemorate the fasting of Christ in the wilderness. You know, but see, after the 5th century, through the influence of Rome, Rome, you get these things going on, All right? So with that being said, family, family, family. We're done. We are done. All praise to the Most High. Ko kabot. Ko tehelim ko kabot wahati fede le Yahweh avinu Elohim. All praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh. Our Father, our Elohim, our deity, our power. That is why the church has paradosis or tradition of communion on Sundays. 
That is why they have communion on Sundays. And we see how Sunday came to be the day on when is, you know, why, why they're taking communion. And they're calling it the Lord's Day because they suppose that Yeshua Jesus rose on Sunday. And we see Constantine, what did he come in and do? He pretty much syncretized everything. He was like, oh, it's you in day. Ooh. That lines up well with what we've already been doing. We've already been worshiping the S-U-N. Constantine said, we already been worshiping the S-U-N. You know, we been worshiping the S-U-N of Mithras and Apollos of Hercules. Yeah, everybody, let's do Sunday. S-U-N. <laughs> Let me establish a, a legal day. You know, um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, I know there are people who may be out there who disagree. And um, that's fine. But but like I always say, if you disagree, please bring us some sources to prove us otherwise. Like we we have, we pre my sis has presented this information to me and the elder. We looked at it, got a chance to examine it ourselves. And we stand united with her on this information and what has been going, what is going out. And I thank the most high for the elder for bringing out more clarity because there were some things that I, would not, I wasn't aware of that he shared. So we stand and we're united. So for those who oppose, if you're out there, we're not trying to take no challenges, but every so often we may get a, we may get a knock at the door. So if you're going to knock at the door, we welcome it. And we, we don't mind sitting down talking over a few things. We don't mind talking, discussing the differences. And me and the elder and the Shanti have done that before. We had we had a brother, built with the brother, and it went pretty well. You know what I'm saying? But what we're saying is, is that if you guys, if, if there's anyone out there who disagrees, no problem. Make sure that you bring your sources. I don't want to hear your opinion. We don't want to hear your emotions. We don't want to hear a Sunday tirade preaching sermon. We don't want to hear no singing and dancing, no back flipping, no heeing and hying. And <laughs> but you guys got to know. No, just bring the information. I've been in this community for a very long time, longer than most. Amen. And all I ask, and I, and I have been in the ring off the record on various other platforms with those who call themselves the best. So what I'm saying is, is that and some of those guys the scholarship is very questionable. So for what I'm saying is that please bring sources because for some reason, when we say bring sources, it's as if they don't, it, it don't matter about sources. It, no, that doesn't matter. My opinion matters. No, bring the sources. That's all we ask. And if you do not bring the sources, we're just going to ignore you and treat you that you're not there. Bring the sources. That's all we ask. We've been doing it for the last couple of years. Did the Galatians series, did this series, did this series on Paul and the Talmud, I mean on Peter and the Talmud, Acts chapter 10. And we tell people, you see all this information we're sharing? Bring the sources. If you do not have the sources, do not knock on our door and do not attempt to jump on our lawn. You're wasting your time. Bring the sources. I don't care what type of schooling you have, that's fine. We, it doesn't matter to me, none of us. Just bring the information and let's deal with it. Just want to say that and I'm done. Is, it, is this where we give the slow clap, Shanti? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you was going in. <laughs> Amen to all of yeah, that. Figure that pain. Word. <laughs> right. Right, amen. right, right. Amen. Amen. Because we don't mind being challenged. You know, if your if your information can't be challenged, then it can't be proven. So you can't call it the truth. You know, and that's you know, and so challenges make us better researchers and we become better students who can expound, you know, on the things that we've learned. So I we don't mind, you know, at all. You know, one thing I'll say, and this is my opinion, based on the information presented and other study. Um, and this is just my opinion, but I, you know, the uh, Catholic Church says that Peter is their first pope, and I, I disagree with that. And I venture to say this: 
based on the history, I say Constantine is their first pope. Mm. And that's because when you look at what the pope is, as I was talking about earlier, the, the Catholic Church is not just a religious denomination. It is also a geopolitical power. It has a capital. It has a government. It has its own currency. It has representatives to the nations. And it has pretty much um, churches in, in most countries on the earth, even in some what would be considered Islamic countries. You know, I remember during the war in Afghanistan, some very, very peculiar things happened with when they were cutting off heads and stuff like that in Afghanistan and Iraq, a Catholic priest was taken. And I thought for sure he would die. But uh, edict from the, from the Vatican came and told them to let him go. And they let that man go. And this happened on more than one occasion. And I thought, wow, they really have some clout, even with people that you think are their historical enemies. But... <clears throat> It kind of, excuse me, it shows you how deep the rabbit hole goes. And so I look at Constantine because he represents what the Pope is. The Pope is not only a religious figure, but he's a political figure. Constantine, even though he was primarily political, he held sway over the religious establishment in his day and forced them to come together, even though the majority of those invited to the council didn't show up. What he did was he used those who did show up to basically establish the order that he wanted. And then that laid the foundation for what came afterwards. You know, and so I look at him as being the first pope. He's the, he's the imperial figure that, you know, sets up this pseudo religious system that is becomes Catholicism and then transmogrifies into Christianity. And is what I think most of the world follows now. Even those who claim to be Protestants, well, what is a Protestant? It's a person protesting against the Catholic Church. You're protesting against the authority in Rome, you know, but the Catholic Church looks at you as a runaway child. Yep. You know, and so they still consider you Catholic. And so all of these, you know, these different things that, you know, we're seeing you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of history to absorb, but I think it also helps us put the scriptures into the proper perspective to see what was prophesied by the prophets and by Christ. Many things he revealed in his parables of what would happen. And, you know, when he talked about the kingdom of heaven is like a, a tree that's, you know, been planted or mustard seed. And then all the fowls in the air come to lodge in it. And, and the, the, uh, the leaven hidden in three measures of meal, all these different things is talking about what would happen in our day. And we see it come to pass because we see the religious systems that has, or the religious system that has been established in which the scriptures also call mystery Babylon, you know, the great harlot. So, and why is it a harlot? Because it's deviated from the truth. It sullied itself with what? other thing it's prom it's a promiscuous doctrine that has engrafted other ideologies and, and pagan religious systems into itself and so it's drinking from the cup of whoredoms and in spreading its ideology it's causing the rest of the world to also drink from that cup of whoredoms mm -hmm. and so you see it you know in the book of revelation and you see it in the visions and images of daniel and so we see this system and it's here now and it's in place. As the apostles wrote in their day, the spirit of the Antichrist is already here, even though the Antichrist himself has not yet been revealed. That spirit, that anti-God spirit has been at work for a long time and has been growing and developing this particular system that we see now. And some of the history that we read today has brought it out. Yeah, uh, I mean... As as Mr. Blacktastic, Brother BA, and I continue to question, like I said, we make adjustments, we make changes, you know. And and if something's not not in line with the Torah, the foundation that was that was laid uh, to, to to Moshe and continued by the prophets and the apostles, then we don't want nothing to do with it. And we're making a genuine effort to do that because 
we really love the most high Yod Hey Wah Hey Yahweh and we love his son Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. And, and guess what? I'm sorry, sis, finish up. I, my Go, ahead. Go ahead. It's not a sin to want to walk in the commandments. <laughs> not a right. sin. Not at all. Not at all. But for some reason, that is the narrative that a certain group of individuals like to push. Mm -hmm. So, and those individuals we don't take serious. I mean, there's, there's no point in rambling with them. So, but if they choose to engage, again, bring the sources and so don't give me that, oh, I forgot. No, that was the purpose <laughs> of the meeting. Bring the sources. Let's not stress that, please, because I'm I'm starting to get very disappointed in a lot of individuals, and I'm convinced that um, I'm at the point to where I'm I don't take many very serious anymore. I really don't. So please convince me otherwise, please. I'm I'm asking you to please give me a reason to believe in some of y'all again. Give me a reason to give y'all the benefit of the doubt. Seriously. I'm done. Well, yeah. Brother B.A., <laughs> if you really had faith, uh, you could eat that pork chop sandwich. <laughs> 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 oh, Lord. <laughs> you can lay your holy hands on that pork bacon and just say, yeah. <laughs> if you really believed him. Shondo. <laughs> <laughs> Man, paradosis part two, y'all. Tradition. Why, why, why? Sunday church folks takes the communion, you know, and we we know it got nothing to do with what Yeshua and the disciples were doing the day before Passover. The day before Passover, we established in paradosis part one is a seuda mafsechet. They were having a ritual meal before they fasted. And they were going to fast after that ritual meal in commemoration of the firstborn Israelites that were spared from being killed by the 10th plague before the exodus out of Egypt. Right? Look at your traditions. Are your traditions crack? Are you addicted to your traditions so much that you just can't get rid of them, even though some of your traditions, they go against the Most High, yod heh wah -Hey. They nullify the word of the Most High, the Lord God of Israel, like Yeshua said. Are you, are you just that beholden to your traditions? Right? And what we're doing, what we're doing is trying to make an effort, we're making an effort to follow the applicable law, statutes, and commandments and the traditions that we uphold to now, as far as I'm concerned, they don't nullify the word of the Lord God of Israel because they line up and are in tune with what the Lord God of Israel has in place. That's why you see some of us celebrating Purim, right? It's from Esther. That's why you see some of us celebrating Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication in November or December, right? Those are traditions. Those were not set by the Lord God of Israel. However, they line up with what the Lord God of Israel has placed. Right? The, Sis, Maccabeans, you can... when the Maccabeans came in and reestablished that they were going to do the Torah, that's a tradition. It has nothing. It's, it's not breaking anything of the Torah. Go ahead, Bia. No, but see, we can admit to that. Admit to what? Admit to the fact that making an attempt to come back to the Torah to the best of our ability, we can admit to that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Jews back then, they made, even though there were some things they were off on, you know what I'm saying, when it comes to the Holocaust, or the oral traditions, but what we see, rather you are into it or not, you see the effort, mm. you see the drive, you right. see, and we're, not, and we're not giving credence, and we're not saying, go believe the oral traditions and to follow them. We're not saying that. What we're saying is for those, those for those who study them like as we do, we see the effort, we see the love, 
It's in the zeal and the zealousness within the Jews or within those who are Israelites. We see the 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 one team of being zealous for the Torah, and and of course we see some things that they twisted, some things that they added, some things they overly did, and we're not justifying the, the the wrong things they did to try to enforce Torah, but you see the want and the zealousness of wanting to get back in the grace of the Most High. These people right. cut themselves off from the Gentiles and say, we're not dealing with y'all no more. Even though we know you're supposed to be a light to y'all, but you know what? We're not dealing with you. We're going to cut you off and we're going to get back to our God. So you you have to, so one thing, you take a, t- notice that. So there's nothing wrong with wanting to want to get back in the Most High's good graces to the best of your ability. Sometimes how we go about it can be wrong. You know what I'm saying? Just wanted to say that. All we're doing is acknowledging that we're in the house of the Most High yod heh We're in the house of the Lord God of Israel. All right? And if we're in the house of the Lord God of Israel, that's the Father. And we're obeying the rules. Why? Because we love the Father. We're obeying the rules. We know there's no entitlement. We know we can't get the benefits without obeying the rules. We're not getting, we're not obeying to get the benefits. We're obeying because we love. We're obeying because we love. Every house has rules. Every house has things that is measured by it. Amen. I don't know if any of you guys go into your mother and your father's house and saying, I'm not going to obey your rules. You going to love me anyway, and you just gonna give me what I want anyway. I don't need your rules. I don't know if any of you say that. And I don't know if any of you who are parents will want your children to say, Hey, mommy, daddy, I'm in your house. I don't have to obey your rules. You just love me anyway. Give me what I want. I'm entitled. I don't know any of you parents who would like any of your children saying that to you. So we try not to say that to our father. We love. Yeah, and I'm currently. We have love from that. We have love from that father unconditionally, right? We have the grace from that father. So in order to show our gratefulness for that grace, we make an effort to be obedient. Exactly. Not to try to be perfect, right? Not to try to be perfect. Not to try to get salvation. We're already in the house. We're already saved. We're saying thank you for the salvation. Therefore, we're going to be obedient. So with that being said, y'all, this is Powder Doses Part 2, Why Communion? So please go back to the very first one, Powder Doses Part 1, Tradition, which is the Greek word for tradition. Go back and look at that. And with that being said, um, I'm going to say the priestly Aaronic blessing. Then we're going to get out of here. All right. Priestly Aaronic blessing from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. All right. Yaveri Yahweh panava lecha vihunecha. Yesah Yahweh panava lecha wa yasem lecha shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine on you and show you favor. May Yahweh lift up his face towards you. That means accept you. And may Yahweh grant you shalom, peace, wellness, wholeness. All right? So until next time, y'all, this was Torah Tittles of the Text, Paradosis or Tradition, Part 2, Y Communion. Until the next live, we'll see y'all. Y'all continue to have a good and blessed day with whatever you're doing. Be safe. Be cool. Love on one another. All right. Show some dignity. Show some honor. Show some respect among one another. All right. All right. So shalom, shalom. Mishpacha wahavari.